Today, we're going to talk about George Santos. Now, this is if you're into bingo and the behavior panel bingo, get your card out because this you're going to run the card on this one. It's going to be unbelievable what's going on here. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. Yeah, this is simple. This is Piers Morgan brought in one of the most renowned liars of a, in a while. This is George Santos, who was elected to the third congressional district of New York. And so he's in the House of Representatives and he has been scandal after scandal after scandal. Is you may as well be completely honest now. Of course. Because I don't say there's any upside in continuing to fuel the media narrative that you're this terrible liar, right? So, you know, I'm very, I, I, listen, I don't have a horse in the race. I'm not an American citizen. <laughs> you're not my congressman. You don't serve me. It's not my hard earned cash going on supporting you. So, in that sense, I'm slightly detached from this. All I can say is that in the UK, we're aware of you because there's been this constant running theme now for months on end that you tell a lot of whoppers, as we would call it, in the UK. And so I think it's a good, it's a good chance, Congressman, to just try and work out where the truth lies. Because why not? Um, there's a claim that you said you attended the Horace Mann School in the Bronx, New York, during your first years of high school but had to leave uh, in your senior year because your parents fell on hard times in 2008. Is that true? Did you attend that school? I attended it for a brief period of time and then went back to the public school system and then dropped out of the public school system and attained a GED. I was always very truthful of not completing high school due to financial difficulties. With I, I mean, a spokesman for the school told CNN there's no record of you ever attending. Why would that be? Uh, I, I challenge to see what, they're, what name they're looking under. If you look at my entire history of education, it was not under the name George Santos. So I just, what, what name did you attend that school? Uh, a, a variation. It was either George DeVolder or Anthony DeVolder. I wouldn't know. I was a minor. I don't know which but way. CNN, I believe, checked all the variants of the names that you've used, and there was no record the school could find of you ever attending. I was there for six months of ninth grade. In what year would that have been? Uh, 2004. So for six months, you were indisputably at the Horace yeah. Mann School. In the and, then moved into, and then moved into the public system. And then in 2006, I attained a GED due to just circumstances. Why, why, why would the school not be able to find a record of I don't know. Uh, what I don't what know. name should they be looking for? I would say George DeVolder. That's how, I, that's how it's on my uh, GED certificate. And you got on the George DeVolder, Anthony DeVolder? Well, th officially, the only two names I've ever used on documentation has been George DeVolder or George Santos. Period. So there should be a record of one of those yeah. at that school. Of course. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'll try to be short on this one. This is just, there's so much. I, I'll fill your bingo card in my first video if we're not careful. He starts off with a pitch change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You hear his voice change when he goes at, of course, when he says, of course. He immediately goes into something I always refer to as sacred space, where he puts his hands together. That gives him distance. That gives him a, a barrier. And then he mills his fingers and thumbs. That's an adapter to make that space comfortable. It's a powerful tool. However, Joe Navarro says when you're steepling or have your hands closed and you use your thumbs, you're confident. When you don't use your thumbs, you're not. So there's no confidence in him when we see this. Scott, I'm going to leave one out, but if you don't say it, I'm going to have to bring it up when it comes because it's one of yours, and it's such a beautiful example of it. When he's asked why not clear up these problems, he purses his lips. Sometimes people point with their lips in some cultures. It's disapproval in most of ours. Now let's talk about the horse man school. He, if he went to horse man school, he went to the horse man school for the academically delayed, and he failed math because – he tells us in here what year he, he was born in 1988. He says he was in the ninth grade and he was 16 years old. I don't know that horse man school takes 16 year old ninth graders every day, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. And we'll hear his math screw up as he goes through. And you see him try to do math, try to do something in there. But I don't think that this guy went there and I think he's just wherever. Why, also watch his blink rate increase and go through the roof when he's poked about horse man. And then his chin drop, his respiration rises and it gets shallow. He chaffs and redirects beautifully. When you ask how this guy got away with all this, he is one of the most elegant chaff and redirect guys I've seen because he smoothly does it. He doesn't do it in a big fashion. He finds a small topic that will take him off and runs down it. Then he gets to that GED thing. It's a beautiful way. But Piers Morgan is a pretty damn good interviewer, and he asks the hardest question, and that's why. Why is hard? And then he goes, but yeah, but yeah, yeah. and the only name he didn't use is Vinny, is in my cousin Vinny, because he's using the my cousin Vinny method of delaying the the judge from finding out he's not an attorney. He just gives extra names and extra names and extra names. 
everything I see here, I think the only time I see him do anything that looks reasonable in that, and guys, I'm just going to knock this off because I'm going to keep going. There's a ton in here. But he does do the Joe Navarro thumbs up when he says that, when he says I was under a different name because he thinks he's got it and he doesn't allow him to get away with it. He just nails him down. Mark, what do you got? Uh, Yeah, well, look, Piers Morgan can be a real pain sometimes, but here he's an absolute delight throughout all of this. Uh, Love him dearly throughout all of this. Great target uh, for him. Uh, So, Piers, great great use of the idea of the whopper, which is very colloquial for the UK. Uh, It'd be lovely if further on he uses the idea of telling pork pies or porkies, (laughs) which is Cockney rhyming slang for pork pie, lie. Just just wanted you to know that, you know, so you've got a little bit of Cockney rhyming slang in in case that comes up. um, I think I see Jupiter's delight early on. I wouldn't be surprised if I do. I mean, it could be contempt, it could be disdain, but I don't, I don't see anything that it would be to do with. So I'm going to go that he knows he's, he's going to start his process of making up stories right from moment one. I see eye blocks. And what I mean by that is the lids will come down, the, the, the head will shade a little bit. So it's not really, you know, a look off or, or a, or a blink or even a slow blink. It's a real shading of, of the eyes, you know, not wanting to see almost this terrible situation that you've got yourself into. And lots of swallow uh, reflex there as well, more than I would expect to see in succession, even under the pressure, under the, under the pressure of a national interview. Um, eyes glance off. I would say that's probably exit checking. Uh, that fight and flight is starting. The pressure of lying is starting and, and his unconscious is going, well, how would I run away out of this if I needed to? Uh, I, I saw the lip purse as well. Yeah, absolutely. On why not tell the truth? There's a lip purse there. Disagreement with telling the truth potentially there. Um, uh, targeting of the eyes as well. And on the yes, there's a single shoulder shrug as well. That's not good to see. Uh, Chase, I don't know whether you've done a behavioral table of elements score here. I would, I would love it if you have, if, if you, if you have, if you haven't, just make one up. Cause I, I just want to, I just want to see what the number is here because I think I'm going to, I'm going to pretty much leave it at body language for that because that was, that was a huge, huge amount, huge amount and tackle some other stuff as we go, go through. Uh, so Chase, will you disappoint me or, or what do you got on this? 36. Oh, okay. Lovely. Thank you. Come on. I was going to give him 168. (laughs) (laughs) This, uh, just for clarification's sake, you need a score of 11 or higher to be considered a a likelihood of deception. So 36 is uh, astounding. But one thing here, there's disdain, I think, coming across the face, Mark, to your point, But it's right when he's told the media have a narrative that he's a terrible liar. Terrible liar. Not a liar, a bad one. So one big thing I was thinking uh, watching this was this looks like it might be disdain or contempt for being called a bad liar. As if there were a degree of pride maybe in his abilities. So six months as a student there during this little part, there's a single shrug there, the unusual deviation in eye blocking. Mark, you picked up on that. And just the shortest answer yet from uh, all of his baseline, super short answer there. And this guy has the vibe of kind of a grandiose high school bully that everyone in the school secretly knew hated themselves. And a lot of this comes down to a person that is hiding shame. And I want you to remember those two words as we go through the the rest of this video, a person that's hiding shame. What does hiding secret shame make me do publicly? What does that make into a person's character or behavior? That's all I got for that one. Scott. All right. Here, now, this is just my opinion. But Mark, what you're talking about, about seeing the duper's delight, I don't think that's what it is. And Chase, the same thing for that. I don't think he feels proud about doing that. He likes what he's doing. This is a con man. Now, this is just my opinion. So don't come at me. Um, What's his name? George. But this is what I think about, about him or you. I think this is a con man and he's doing what he always does. So he feels comfortable here. No matter what you throw at him, he's like, let's play the game because it's a game to him. He's having fun. He This doesn't bother him. Not even a little bit. So in my opinion, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing somebody go in 
and enjoy what they're doing because they're good at it. He knows this game. He knows how to lie. He knows how to do this. We're going to see everything in this. This is beautiful. We're going to see the just bull face line. We're going to see um, the, the smile and line, like we're talking about the, the enjoyment of line, hide our hard eye contact. Um, he doubles down on his lies. We see everything in this. It's, it's unbelievable. This in this series of, vid- of videos, when he first starts, you see, and, and before he starts answer, answering the question, that forehead comes down, he scoots in a little bit. He's ready for the fight at that point. He's he's It's like the bullfighter has, has come out with a thing, and he's like, all right, let's do this. He's ready for it. Keep an eye on his teeth and his tongues, and, and on his tongues, and his tongue and his mouth. Watch <laughs> what happens there. Watch when he says under. He says under. There's this. It seems odd, and it's and it sounds kind of weird. But you really have to pay attention to what he's saying there because that's how he's adapting. He's using his mouth to adapt. He's done something with his lips. He's he's done those fillers or something because his lips are all like like fish mouth the whole time, and they look odd. His his lips don't look normal. Something's not right about that. But that's where he's adapting. His tongue juts around in there. It's flying around in there. Keep an eye on that because instead we see some adapting in his hands. But we don't see anywhere else. But he's still on. He's still feeling that excitement. He's still got all that stress and, and tension from from being on TV and and the sport he's playing now of lying because he's a pathological liar. That sport is on, so he's got to somehow get rid of that built up stress and tension by adapting or self soothing behaviors, as Joe Navarro says. And he's doing it with his mouth and inside his mouth. Listen to to the words he uses. The pronunciation of these words he uses is really important. Listen to how the the sentences go from really short, like you were saying, uh, Chase, these really short answers and short sentences. In a few minutes, they're going to get so long. Listen to this progression as it goes as it goes on. How the sentences get longer and longer and longer. At one point, they become three times as long as they are in the first video. So far, we've seen eye blocking. We've seen um, the head shaking in agreement, and these and the eye blocking when he gets when he gets the information that he uh, isn't believed or is called a liar. That's where his eyes stay. And Chase refers to that to shutter speed. They say close too long uh, when he blinks. He he blinks for too long. We're seeing everything in this. Um, I can I can go on and on about this, but he's laser focused on everything happening and everything he's saying. And one more thing, I know what you're going to jump on, Greg, is the shoulder, one single shoulder, and the chin. One because it, most of the time we're not absolutes on here, but every time, pretty much every time we see someone with a single shoulder shrug and that chin goes over there, even Joe Navarro talks about that and says it's it's every time we've seen it, that person's end up li- been lying about something. Doesn't mean they it that it's a it's a tell for sure that when your single shoulder goes up and your chin heads toward it, you're lying. But that's all we've seen on here. Every time it happens, so I'll, I've got a ton, but I'll I'll leave it there. I got the one more years, one people. more years that you didn't mention, Scott. What was it? One more years is extra face because he's doing extra face. Oh, while he's waiting. Yeah, Dad Gummy. It's a beautiful I'm, example of it, and it yeah. just you cannot miss it. The island is you. Is you may as well be completely honest now. Of course, because I don't say there's any upside in continuing to fuel the media narrative that you're this terrible liar, right? So, you know, I'm very... I, I, listen, I don't have a horse in the race. I'm not an American citizen. <laughs> you're not my congressman. You don't serve me. It's not my hard-earned cash going on supporting you. So, in that sense, I'm slightly detached from this. All I can say is that in the UK, we're aware of you because there's been this constant running theme now for months on end that you tell a lot of whoppers, as we would call it, in the UK. And so I think it's a good, it's a good chance, Congressman, to just try and work out where the truth lies. Because why not? Um, there's a claim that you said you attended the Horace Mann School in the Bronx, New York, during your first years of high school, but had to leave uh, in your senior year because your parents fell on hard times in 2008. Is that true? Did you attend that school? I attended it for a brief period of time and then went back to the public school system and then dropped out of the public school system and attained a GED. I was always very truthful of not completing high school due to financial difficulties. I mean, a spokesman for the school told CNN there's no record of you ever attending. Why would that be? Uh, I I challenge to see what what name they're looking under. If you look at my entire history of education it was not under the name George Santos so I just, what, what name did you attend that school? Uh, a, a variation it was either George DeVolder or Anthony DeVolder I wouldn't know I was a minor I don't know which but way. CNN I believe checked all the variants of the names that you've used and there was no record the school could find of you ever attending. I was there for six months of ninth grade. 
In what year would that have been? Uh, 2004. So for six months, you were indisputably at the Horace yes. Mann School. In the and, then moved into, and then moved into the public system. And then in 2006, I attained a GED due to just circumstances. Why, why, why would the school not be able to find a record? Of I don't know. Uh, what I don't what know. name should they be looking for? I would say George DeVolder. That's, that's how it's on my uh, GED certificate. And you got on the George DeVolder, Anthony DeVolder? Well, th officially, the only two names I've ever used on documentation has been George DeVolder or George Santos. Period. So there should be a record of one of those yeah. at that school? Of course. The second claim was that on the, on the campaign website that you graduated with a degree in economics and finance from Baruch College in 2000. I'll, say, I'll save you the, the... I did not attain a college education. That was... That, was, that regrettably so, is one of my biggest uh, uh, regrets in life. So that, that was a lie? To, absolutely. And I admitted to it, and I've, I've made peace with the fact that I made a bad choice in making that decision. It wasn't easy. What was the simple explanation for why you met? Why would you lie about something like that? Expectation on society, the pressure, couldn't afford it, uh, decided I wanted to run for office, although I had built a very credible business career, and I just didn't have that part of my biography that I could not give anything. Did you not think that you'd be cool? You know, I just went with it. I, I didn't think... I mean, if you're going to make up a lie, are you thinking at all? I just think it was a stupid decision in my part. Very stupid decision that I regret every day. I mean, especially because I can... So, I'm sorry to cut you off, but especially because mm. I can prove the chops and the backing without the education. But this stems more deeper into the political apparatus and the political culture of New York State. And that would take a lot more time than this right. program to go over to explain. No, but no, that's no where, I, 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 I can imagine... It listen, from. I understand the desire to want to be more impressive with your record than you are. I, I'm bemused that you would be naive enough to think that you could run as a politician in New York in particular and not expect to get what happened to you, which is a massive comeuppance when they discover this stuff isn't true. Stupid. It was stupid. All right, Chase, what do you got? So let me just sum up the overall message of this one clip here. Uh, it was a stupid decision, and it's somebody else's fault. That's it. That's the whole message here. This is, uh, in my opinion, uh, doing 20 years in the military, nine deployments. Uh, this is the behavior of a coward and not a leader by any measure of the word. And most likely, there's something going on internally uh, with this person that is probably severe. Uh, and it may be at a, at a point of pathology. I'm not, I'm not an expert in that. But his blink rate just soars upward around the word naive. And this is a great way for us to take a look to see what reliable behavior indicators we can see in a few moments. And at the end here, uh, we're, where we're seeing him call the decision stupid a couple of times, there's a few things going on. His romancer mode, as Scott and Greg, you guys would call it, is just really turned on. And this is where we see his voice pitch speed up his voice raise in pitch then speed up even his body starts speeding up and this is fear fear increases the speed of movement of our limbs our eyelids our head all of that stuff all of our body parts and i think there's a part of him that's actually enjoying the thrill of this experience yeah and it it is almost a copy paste of a video that we did before on Dr. Phil about a massage therapist named Tarek. And it is a copy paste of that kind of behavior. And he seemed to genuinely enjoy the negative attention and the spotlight. And I think he genuinely believed that he should be the one deciding what's right and wrong. And is most likely, this is the behavior that if I saw this in someone else, I would automatically think this is the behavior of a malignant narcissist at best. And of course, that's no diagnosis. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so let me unpack what I think you absolutely hit that narrative that, it, that he's got there completely. Let me break it down a little bit. So he's spinning, lying into, first of all, the regret of not achieving a college education. So brilliant maneuver there because Pierce is there going, look, you're lying. And he's going, yeah, I absolutely regret not getting a, a, a college education. And then he says, but he's made peace with that. So what a, again, what a brilliant maneuver there to the idea of peace and making peace with yourself. So he's turned lying into, I didn't get a college education, 
and now I'm at peace with myself. And then he goes, and it's not easy. It's not easy. So he's now pushed that into triumph. Now he's now he's tri- he's gone from liar to what an utter triumph on my part. Okay. So here's where he goes next. He goes to society's expectations. Okay, so he's now bought in a bigger entity, massive entity that's expecting stuff of him. He pulls in poverty. Then the idea of democracy. So what a fantastic, I mean, you know, if I could spin like this, I'd be in work every day in politics. Society's expectations to poverty, to the idea of democracy, and then the idea of structural exclusivity. Basically says, look, I get excluded from this democratic process, somebody who's been voted in. And he's saying, look, I'm getting excluded from from this whole process. Well, what a brilliant, brilliant maneuver to turn from Pierce's, you're a liar, into a victim trope and print so much of that currency, so much of that very current currency, which gets a lot of attention, which gets a lot of airplay, which can get a lot of sympathy, and and quite rightly so, because there are victims out there. There are absolutely people who are victims who need help. But if you go around printing that currency all the time, it devalues it for the people who really need that currency. And I'm, I mean, the awful thing is, here's a person who's printing that currency, and just as you're saying there, enjoying minting that stuff, enjoying the minting the minting of that currency and devaluing it for the people who really need that. Um, extraordinary to see, exciting to see in some, some ways and awful to see in others. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I think it's very methodical. I think if we go back to lying for sport, it's something I always say, there are people who enjoy lying for sport. All of us do it sometime. We play around with facts with people just to do something, but not like this. This is about life changing events for people. Look, most people that get away with, to your point, Scott, cons, there's a reason. There's a reason it's called confidence. What they're doing is they're not tricking you. They're getting your confidence that they are what you expect them to be. <clears throat> and then they check the boxes. This guy was invented, whether he invented himself or somebody else. He's a, an openly gay Republican candidate, with one of the few who's been elected that was not already in office. He grew up poor. He had to drop out of school to support his family. Look, if you are trying to build a candidate and everything hits a checklist, you might question whether that's true or not. And this guy, this move right here to me is more than just lying for for sport. This is a massive redirect for him. This is an element. This is checkers or chess or whatever the hell he's playing. When he comes out and he's going to do a big throwaway sacrificial guilt or what I call trading guilt. Yes, I did lie about college because I was in such a bad place and it's important to the world, but it wasn't important to me. And I I have all the chops to prove it. And, and, and you should be really careful when people fit everything you're looking for. Number one, I think as importantly as what he says was I have made peace with it, Mark. I think there's also the implied. So should you. That's the piece I think I hear in his voice because the lilt at the end and that lower lip retracts when he says it. And we know that's about looking for some kind of reassurance when you do that. If you watch a little child withdraw their lower lip, they're looking for some kind of reinforcement. And then when he talks about why things are bad for him, it's not a discussion, it's a bullet list. That means it doesn't really have any meaning to him. Trust me, if somebody has screwed you over and left you in a situation where you can't win because you didn't have a degree and you had a list of things, you, those are called grievances. And people get animated about grievances. They don't bullet list them. It's just not the way things work. And then when he says, do, when he asked him, do you think you should get away with it? He says, no, but he does a single shoulder shrug again. We get comes back. He smiles as he gets to this pinnacle of his victimhood about the political machine. Mark, I have on here something very similar to you. It looks like he's making Rob a run at Robin Hood. He wants to be Robin Hood, even calls himself stupid. And I think all of this is trading guilt or turning over a big stone so he'll stop looking. And he thinks he's going to make a big tactical blunder that turns to a strategic blunder in the next video. But he thinks he's paving the way and that he's working Piers Morgan to get there. Scott, what do you got? All right. Now, going back to the word stupid, every time he says stupid, that's when that single shoulder goes up, that single shoulder shrug, and then that chin goes toward it. I don't think he thinks it was stupid. We'll talk about that a little more more in a little bit. 
when he first starts out, he, we, we hear fading facts where he says, I did not retain a college education. Who talks like that? Who says, did, have you ever said I did not retain a glass of water when I went to or in the kitchen? Nobody says that. It's just weird that it, this whole thing. That's why I'm thinking I know he's thought about this and he's had to lie about this one before as well because he's ready for it. He And then he, he tries to scoot right past that thing by saying he regretted it, like what you're talking about, Mark. Then he gives a list of reasons why, like you were saying, Greg, that it's okay. He goes, he does a list of, of okaying this. The whole time he's looking peers right in the eyes. This is this is just brazen <laughs> lying, coming out, just swinging, man. And then when he says, uh, I just think it was a stupid decision on my part. Like I said before, he doesn't think that at all. He thinks it was brilliant because it worked and he'd done it before. And he talks about that as well. So I, I, I think that's another thing we need to keep watching out for. And then when, when Piers is bemused by the balls this guy has to lie about how he got in politics, he simply agrees and smiles and kind of laughs and goes right past it like it's nothing. It's uh, Wow. So you, this is like, watch. here's what it's like watching the crocodile hunter. You know, when he goes out and he would get those big poisonous snakes and all that stuff, and you'd see him out in the wild, and he'd be like, look at this, man, you know, and talking to him and stuff. That's what Pierce has got. He's got him alive, on a live con, a live grifter right there, and we're watching him almost out in the wild as he's holding it. We're watching it, him lie and do everything that he does out in the wild. He's doing it right there, on, in, right there in front of him, and they're filming it. I'm sorry, I'm getting all worked up. This is this is this is classic. This is this has got everything. This is uh, this might be the best one we've ever done. The eyewitness is you. The second claim was that on the on the campaign website that you graduated with a degree in economics and finance from Baruch College in 2000. I'll say I'll save you the, the. I did not attain a college education. That was that was. That, regrettably so, is one of my biggest uh, uh, regrets in life. So that that was a lie. Absolutely. And I admitted to it, and I've, I've made peace with the fact that I made a bad choice in making that decision. It wasn't easy. What, what's the simple explanation for why you met? Why would you lie about something like that? Expectation on society, the pressure, couldn't afford it, uh, decided I wanted to run for office, although I had built a very credible business career, and I just didn't have that part of my biography that I could not give anything. Did you not think that you'd be cool? You know... I just went with it. I, I didn't think, I mean, if you're going to make up a lie, are you thinking at all? I just think it was a stupid decision in my part. Very stupid decision that I regret every day. I mean, especially because I can, so, I'm sorry to cut you off, but especially because mm. I can prove the chops and the backing without the education. But this stems more deeper into the political apparatus and the political culture of New York State. And that would take a lot more time than this right. program to go over to explain. No, but no, that's no. Where, I, 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 that's I can where imagine. It Listen, from. I understand the desire to want to be more impressive with your record than you are. I, I'm bemused that you would be naive enough to think that you could run as a politician in New York, in particular, and not expect to get what happened to you, which is a massive comeuppance when they discover this stuff isn't true. Stupid. It was stupid. You claimed on your resume to have gained a master's in business at New York University with a GMAT of 710. I, I've, which would, which would, it would indicate academic excellence, but that's not true, right? Well, the reality is I don't know where that GMAT comes from. I, I never put that out on my website or my bio. But you didn't get a master's in business? No, no, but I'm just saying that... The GMAT was on your resume, I think. At which the resume was never furnished or, or supplied by me. Who supplied that? I, I have no idea where that came from. Well, someone that, did it on your behalf. I'm not saying no. I. I didn't supply it, and mm. nobody associated with me supplied it. That came from the GOP, and I'm still trying to understand where that came from. But you never got a master's in business at New York University? No, no like I said, no. Right. I mean, again, <laughs> did you not think people would find this out? You know, Pierce, not after I you're had... Not, you're not running to be like a reality TV no, star. No, no, I understand. Right? You know, if you, if you were going on Celebrity Apprentice, which I went on, right, it doesn't matter. You can embellish stuff about yourself. Nobody cares, right? But to run for Congress of the United States and to just tell blatant lies about even your academic record, I'm just struck, not necessarily that a politician would lie, but that you would think no one would find out. Well, I'll, I'll humour you this. I ran in 2020 for the same exact seat um, for Congress, and I got away with it then, and I guess... Right. Well, that's honest. Stupid. So you thought, actually, they don't 
They're not going to find out. No, I didn't think so. But to, to that effect, um, it's an embarrassing. It's, it's humbling to have to admit your faults as a human mm. being. And I, you know, I wish genuinely if the media put the equal amount of efforts and resources, and, and I'm not saying this mm. as villainizing the media, but just let's keep it fair on all 435 members of the House and 100 members of the Senate, I think the American people would have more clarity of who represents them in Congress. I'm not saying, I'm well, not I pointing. I say, I listen, I think the media, both at local level and national level, have pretty well been forensic about everyone that's in Congress, right? I mean, maybe not to quite the degree you've had to sustain it, because they knew with you they had basically a wounded animal, and if they kept going long enough, they'd probably find a load more. Right, you know, it's, it's human nature. Well, if you don't know who we are, we're the behavior panel. And I'm Scott Rouse, I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes, did 20 years in the U.S. military, wrote the number one best-selling book on behavior profiling, influence, and persuasion. Greg. Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, including the most dangerous business book you'll ever read that recently premiered as the number one business negotiation book. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, just one thing on this which really kind of interests me is the wounded animal metaphor that comes up there. The idea that um, this subject here is now a wounded animal that the media has kind of come in to feed on or predate upon. Now, why is that an interesting metaphor? Because it might just work for him. If he could be that underdog, if he could be the fully wounded animal, maybe people would feel sorry for him, cut him a break as he's uh, as he's asking for there, you know, he said in in the last uh, the last video, you know, I've made peace with it. And Greg, as you said, maybe other people should make peace with it. Let me off the hook. Let this one go because look, I'm wounded. You've done the damage. It's a good story. It's a good drama that could work for him. So I'm interested to see whether he holds on to that keeps that one going or whether he's going to let that one uh, that one go. You know, it's interesting because it's it's that kind of Cinderella story of inside something very, very mundane, like lying, which everybody does. Of course, everybody does it to greater or lesser degrees. Inside that that mundane thing might be something really, really wonderful and beautiful. And he's kind of playing that Cinderella story with in, inside my mundane lying actually is some self-revelation, some destruction of the structural e exclusivity of politics. Um, the, 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 the feeding frenzy will turn into forgiveness and it all be beautiful again. Let's see whether it works for him. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right, right out of the gate, we're seeing um, we're, we're, we're hearing, in other words, fading facts and things starts getting quiet there. He read on, he, he's seen his own bio online that says what he believes to be is untrue, but he didn't take it down, didn't get it fixed, didn't have anybody take care of that for him. Doesn't really, not really sure who did that. He thinks he is, he thinks he's sure, but he's not really that sure. So we be sure that we're watching that chin come down as from the very first video, we're going to see the whole thing come down to where he's like this when he's talking. So keep an eye on his chin as we go through this. And the way he's answering, I don't think Pierce was ready for this again here because he just agrees with everything. And then he just sits there and waits. He goes, yeah, I did that. And just, there it is. Then what do you do at that point? Because Pierce is ready. He's, he's up and ready to start swinging with him. And he really doesn't give him a chance to do that. The one thing we haven't heard him say so far, and we won't hear him say, is he's sorry or he apologizes. Not once. So be sure and pay attention to that. He's not sorry for what he's doing. He likes what he's doing. The level of narcissism here is through the roof. This guy is not only malignant, this is clinical. He's got a, He's not a psychopath, I don't think, but he, he has he has no, no, he doesn't feel empathy for anyone. From We're going to find out a little bit later on from some of the things he does or, or has done. Um, and then when he allegedly. says stupid, allegedly yeah. done, 
Uh, but again, like I said, it's just my opinion. So don't come at me, bro. If you do. Mm. Anyway, I uh, hope you don't. Um, did you see that uh, chin go through the, go toward the, the single shoulder shrug again? And then when he says um, it's embarrassing and humbling, his illustrators don't connect with what he's doing with as as he's talking. Everything is out of is out of place here. His illustrators aren't where they should be. He's when he talks, it gets a little bit quieter. These are all kinds of red flags you can see on things like this. Be sure you pay attention to the way you feel when you see this guy talking, because that's part of your brain in there, which I go through every time I want this time. That's letting you know, gives you gentlemen, gives you the gut, your gut feeling and oh, ladies or women. It gives you that's the woman's intuition you're feeling. Don't forget how that feels, because this is the way it feels when a con is talking to you, when they're trying to talk you into doing something you don't want to do, sell you something, whatever it is, when you get this feeling heads up. Uh, then we see another brilliant chaff and redirect by talking about the the resources being aimed at others besides him by making sure he tells what the problem is, but it's not just me. And here's what you should be looking at over it's literally chaff and redirect at that point. So Greg, I know, I know you'll eat that up. And then we see contempt on the uh, right side of his face and he sticks through his, his tongue through his teeth. Remember I said, keep an eye on that. It's really quickly just pops out through there. Now, quite often what you'll see with children and someone who, who feels like they've gotten away with something, they'll stick their tongue out through their teeth and they'll bite on it a little bit. He's always biting on his tongue. He's always got things moved around in there. Again, I think this is a form of, of adapting for him because he's got so much going on as he's going, uh, as he's weaving his way through this, this game he's playing with peers. Uh, I'll leave it there because I'm going to go on and on. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to tell you this is Anna Delvey as a guy. That's who this is. And I'm going to show you why and why I love this video more than any other video in this whole thing. He starts off, this guy was working when he turned over the stone, when he did the thing that I said earlier, he turned over the first stone so you wouldn't look any further. That was a massive redirect. Hey, yes, my education is an issue. And he moves on into this same question. The redirect, the redirect is working, in his opinion. And Scott, I think that's why he's not trying to cover anything up. He thinks, smooth, I got it. He's got a set on him because this is Piers Morgan. This is not the average person you go and try to snuggle up to. He's a little harder to snuggle up to. And he does a really good job of that redirect. What, what's happening here is he starts down the path. And when you listen to what a person says and watch their body language, it's telling. You can't miss it if you pay attention to this guy. He does a televangelist hands, picks it up, looks straight down the camera, and he says, admitting it's the first step. Well, that right there is a powerful, powerful powerful statement. Then he goes into a long vowel extension at now, and he's moving in to ask for forgiveness is what he's trying to do. And then he makes the biggest mistake he makes in this entire video. He assumes much like Anna Delvey did with Ian from the Australian 60 minutes that he's got him and he tries to build rapport. And he says the stupidest single thing you could probably say to Piers Morgan, you've been through your own issues with this because he has, he's had his own scandal. Watch the body language change as Piers Morgan rebraces, pushes his arms forward, his chin juts forward, works his jaw, purses his lips. It's starting to get ugly now. He's going to now come back at him pretty hard. If you're trying to build rapport and you want to use negativity, you better damn well know who you're using negativity with. And this is not the guy to pick that fight with because now he's going to come back at you. And if you're, if you're not certain that's going on, look for that thrust jaw, that squirming mouth and him drumming his thumbs, drumming his fingers. He's been very patient and now listening to this guy, but now he's just waiting for the next thing. I'll leave it at that. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think this is a lot like the Alex Murdoch trial. The admissions are only coming when he's found out, when everything is found out. That's when the admissions come. My wife has the best intuition in my lifetime I've ever seen in a human being. Better than mine, probably, but I would say yes, better than all these guys. And I let her watch 20 seconds, just 20 seconds of this clip right here. Didn't give her any background. She didn't know who it was. And she physically shuddered <laughs> watching this. And I just asked, like, how do you feel? Like, well, how do you feel after watching that? And she said, I would not allow him within a thousand feet of our children from 20 seconds of just random 20 second clip of in, in the middle of this. So his underlying message is that the media would find stuff on everybody if they were equally scrutinizing everybody. And right there, right at that moment, he revealed everything. 
He thinks that everyone does this. He assumes everyone has really, really bad skeletons in their closet. Because all of us, we tend to think that people are just like us. And if you want to know how someone secretly feels about something, you only have to ask them how they think most other people feel about it. And they'll give you the secret answer. So if you live your life actually thinking that everyone else is hiding lots of skeletons and secrets just like you, what might that say about a potential pathology in your behavior or personality. The eyewitness is you. You claimed on your resume to have gained a master's in business at New York University with a GMAT of 710. I, I've, which, would, which would indicate academic excellence, but that's not true, right? Well, the reality is I don't know where that GMAT comes from. I, I never put that out on my website or my bio. But you didn't get a master's in business. No, no, but I'm just saying that. The GMAT was on your resume, I think. Which the resume was never furnished or, or supplied by me. Who supplied that? I, I have no idea where that came from. Well, someone that, did it on your behalf. I'm not saying no. I, I didn't supply it, and mm. nobody associated with me supplied it. That came from the GOP, and I'm still trying to understand where that came from. But you never got a master's in business at New York University? No, no like I said, no. Right. I mean, again, <laughs> did you not think people would find this out? You know, Pierce, not after I you're had... Not, you're not running to be like a reality TV no, star. No, no, I understand. Right? You know, if you, if you were going on Celebrity Apprentice, which I went on, right, it doesn't matter. You can embellish stuff about yourself. Nobody cares, right? But to run for Congress of the United States and to just tell blatant lies about even your academic record, I'm just struck, not necessarily that a politician would lie, but that you would think no one would find out. Well... I'll, I'll humor you this. I ran in 2020 for the same exact seat um, for Congress, and I got away with it then, and I guess... Right. Well, that's honest. Stupid. So you thought, actually, they don't, they're not going to find out? No, I didn't think so. But to, to that effect, um, it's an embarrassing. It's, it's humbling to have to admit your faults as a human mm. being. And I, you know, I wish... Genuinely, if the media put the equal amount of efforts and resources, and, and I'm not saying this mm. as villainizing the media, but just let's keep it fair. On all 435 members of the House and 100 members of the Senate, I think the American people would have more clarity of who represents them in Congress. I'm not saying, I'm well, not I pointing... I say, I listen, I think the media, both at local level and national level, have pretty well been forensic about everyone that's in Congress, right? I mean, maybe not to quite the degree you've had to sustain it because they knew with you they had basically a wounded animal and if they kept going long enough, they'd probably really find a load more... Right, you know, it's human nature. Uh, I mean, you also claim to be a Wall Street hotshot who worked at Goldman Sachs and Citigroup. Um, your CV, again, your resume, boasted of doubling revenue on a project at Goldman's. Is any of that true? So I... This is where the resume... Doesn't where, where I, I can defend my work career. Mm. I work for subsidiary groups and outside of those companies. You I never did, worked at Goldman's or Citigroup? I, not at them as a direct employee, but I did work for them on the LPGP side through conference organizing, fundraising uh, uh, attempts, and marketing of those fundraisers. Right, but, but you weren't an employee then. You weren't no, a no. Wall Street hotshot, right? I, I, I can argue I've done very well in Wall Street. But not for Goldman's or Citigroup. Not for, not directly for. Them. I mean, neither of them. Neither of them told the New York Times that neither of them like had said, any record of you ever being employed. There. I've never worked directly for them. I was never on their books, but I've done work for them through other companies that I worked for. Yes, sir. All right, Mark. What do you got? Uh, yeah. Look. Uh... I'm going to talk a little bit here about semantic argument because that's what he's using here. If you want a great book to read around propaganda and how to form arguments and how you will be conned and tricked by that straight and crooked thinking by Thules, it was a little pamphlet actually that was originally designed to be dropped on the British troops in the Second World War so that when propaganda was dropped on them, they could have a read of the book and go, oh, I see what you're doing there. I see what game you're playing there. Here's the game he's playing on this one semantic argument which he's playing around with the idea of being employed by working for and working with and so if he can suggest that working with an organization is the same as being employed by if he can semantically reframe that then he he creates a a logical link to him 
having that authority, having that uh, prestige, and therefore he creates a whole new outcome. And that's what we're trying to do with semantic argument is to say, the thing that you think we're starting this logical progression with, it isn't that, it's something else. And therefore, logically, we get a whole different outcome. So watch out for that when people reframe the argument you have right at the start in order to get, get you to a, to another ending. And think about it yourself. If you, if you want to create a resume that is, you know, economical with the truth, you'd be wanting to say, look, I, I worked with X organization and indirectly saved the human race. And therefore, you know, I worked, I worked alongside, um, uh, you know, the World Health Organization and indirectly saved the lives of, you know, millions and millions of people. I mean, I, you know, if I can gloss over the links, you'll probably think that I saved the lives of millions and millions of people, but that it is not the same thing as being employed by and having that, that prestige. That, that's all I got on that one. Cause I think it's, it is beautiful what he's doing there. And there is absolutely no problem with manipulation. It's only the end result that you might have a problem with. There's no bad behaviors, just results that you wanted or didn't want. And I don't think he's trying to manipulate this idea for our good or your good or the public's good. I think he's manipulating for his good. Nothing wrong with manipulation. Manipulation will save your life. People will manipulate things and you'll end up living out of that. But he's not doing it for you. He's doing it for him. That's my take on it. Anyway, Chase, what do you got on this one? So uh, just notice the name of his company is glossed over. He says LPGP and he glosses over it. And it's just an, this company in real life is, is just an events organization company, event planning. The names of these other mystery companies never come up. This is where I wish Pierce would have started peeling back some layers right here. So always focus your attention to what's missing in a conversation. Not only is it going to help you like spot deceptions, it's going to make you a better conversationalist when people aren't lying to you. So if you're just in a conversation, you're paying attention to what's missing, you know where to ask a question about. That's not being an interrogator. You're just being a good conversationalist, showing interest in another person. But let's break down the behaviors here. Just in this one little clip, we have a loss of fluency. He's having trouble coming up with the right words. There's hesitancy there. And I think uh, the third, we, he is the mayor of Qualifier Town. He's been reelected, newly elected mayor of Qualifier Town. There's a very sharp increase in blink rate at the precise moment that we would expect it if we were looking at deception here. Score on the behavioral table of elements, if you're curious, is a 16 here, well above our 11 threshold for a deception likelihood. Scott? All right, I agree with you, but I think he got he won the mayor's race fairly. I think it's probably the only thing he's never had to lie about or cheat about, but he wins it through lying and cheating. So it's this odd juxtaposition. Anyway, that whole first answer was where he takes something very small and blows it up in something big, like Mark was talking about. That's the art of it. That's how they do it. That's one of the keys to it. That's the old. Uh, when you see like on on um, the Andy Griffith show where Opie goes out in the woods, he and his buddies, and they run across this guy who's who's uh, the hobo. <laughs> and he's, he says, you guys want to make some hobo soup? And they go, yeah. He goes, okay, well, I need this. We do it with this rock. And he boils this water and he puts the rock in. Then he makes him go home and get all the vegetables and stuff to put in the soup. And so it starts with something small, just this little thing, but he has people help him do it. It blows up into a whole thing for he probably got three days worth of food there when he's done. But that's what's happening. You're taking something really small and blowing up in something big. And you're right, Mark. Not only does he reframe that thing at the top, at the end he comes back and he frames it up once again, makes sure it's nice and packaged up and, and exits with a yes, sir. So he just okayed the lie again. So it's it's how it works is it's beautiful what he's doing. But this, again, shows us that he is just good at it because he's done it his whole life. He's great at doing that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, a couple of things. When you pad your resume, Mark, those millions and millions will get you in trouble because 
key performance indicators and metrics are how we usually figure out somebody's life. I work in business forever. And you can usually go, well, that couldn't have possibly happened here when they start putting numbers. And that's the reason they're careful not to do it. This guy does a great job of that. And Chase, I'm with you. He loses the ability to finish a sentence very quickly, which means Pierce is under his skin after he stumbled. He's smart enough to be able to tell because he is, like you said, Scott, kind of a comment. Hey, by the way, George, if you're watching us, we would love to have you on here. We know you got a set on you. Come on. We'd love to have you on here. Come talk to us. We would love to have you on here. So there's inconsistency in a stream of thought. Here's a way for you to know when a person is full of it. (coughs) Excuse me. Their inconsistency in thought means they start a sentence in one place and then they change directions mid-sentence after a bunch of jumbled words. That is an opportunity to redirect, ball face redirect right in front of you. When he starts down that one path, he says, about the resume he doesn't talk about my resume he says the resume the resume who talks about the resume do you guys have the resume or do you have your resume usually m- most of us have our own resume and then he says it doesn't where i can can he starts hesitating again then he gets to the meat of what he's saying he said he worked for subsidiary groups look that's all hedging and guarding because you don't know how to attack and to your point chase he brings up one group well, how, the, how did you save them money doing that? I want to know the numbers. I would lean into him and just ask questions. But again, I'm a business guy. And then he uses my favorite entire sentence in, in this whole video. I can argue that I have done well on Wall Street. That's not even close to answering the question. He avoided answering yes or no. He qualifies by using I can argue. Of course, you can argue anything. Right. Anybody can. And then he uses a push-pull word for done very well. Other than the South, when you're rich, I do all right. That's how people talk in the South. And that has meaning. I've done very well. What does that mean to anybody? And he conditions a question again, says I wasn't an employee, but for them. This is interesting because he eye blocks, closes himself away. We've talked about that already, but he shows his lower teeth. That's the first time I've seen anything that looks like anger here to me. If I sum up everything he said is I lied about my employment, but he conditions a question. And there's a guy, a famous guy named Barry Menkow, who took, he was the youngest guy to ever take a company to IPO and he defrauded people out of millions. And his famous quote is fraud is the skin of the truth stuffed with a lie. Well, this guy don't have the skin of the truth in anything we've heard. He's just got an idea and he's redirecting to the point you can't see anything. The eyewitness is you. Uh, And you also claim to be a Wall Street hotshot who worked at Goldman Sachs and Citigroup. Um, your CV, again, your resume boasted of doubling revenue on a project at Goldman's. Is any of that true? So I, this is where the resume doesn't, where, where I, I can defend my work career. Mm. I work for subsidiary groups and outside of those companies. You I never did, worked at Goldman's or Citigroup? I, not at them as a direct employee, but I did work for them on the LPGP side through conference organizing, fundraising uh, uh, attempts, and marketing of those fundraisers. But you, were, but you weren't an employee then. You weren't no, a no. Wall Street hotshot, right? I, I, I can argue I've done very well in Wall Street. But not for Goldman's or Citigroup. Not for, not directly for. Them. I mean, neither of them. Neither of them told the New York Times that neither of them like had said, any record of you ever being employed. I've never worked directly for them. I was never on their books, but I've done work for them through other companies that I worked for. Yes, sir. You campaign bio claimed you ran a foundation called Friends of Pets United in New York and New Jersey that saved two and a half thousand dogs and cats over a five-year period. That true? That's true. Um, but I wasn't alone in, in the operation. Uh, I had. It was a multitude of people. We were all volunteers. I was the operator. I was one of the, I think we were seven founders, if I'm not mistaken, between New York and New Jersey. Uh, my advocacy in, in animal uh, welfare and animal rights is, it stems from my childhood. I've always very compassionate towards animals. I own four dogs at home. They're all rescues to, to one sort. I call it the home of misfits. They're all unwanted, three legs, heart murmur, you know, the issues mm-hmm. like that. And. Um, now, everybody is, after all the revelations about the organization, I wasn't in charge of any of the... I mean, the weird thing is there were no social media accounts for it. No tax oh, Those rec- were all deleted. Well, there were no the ones that anyone could find. No tax records, no evidence of the charity being registered in either New York or New Jersey. They did run one fundraiser with a rescue group in New Jersey in 2017 for which you charged a $50 entry fee, but the group which staged the event said it never received any funds. And... I can attest that that is not true. The funds all ran through through the group, and the the post of the of the facility was who was in charge of all of our of our filings. 
So this came to a surprise as much as what happened to, me to the as tax to records to the social media. I, 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 was, I wasn't in charge of any of that. It was never set up as a charity, even. Well, I, I wouldn't know that. I was the operator. I was the guy putting cats out of the streets into my car, taking them to get. Oh, I understand that, but, but so I, I wasn't in charge of that. I know, but when you say you're the operator of this of this foundation, and there's literally no record of any of it, it well, doesn't doesn't lend much credibility to your operational skills. Like, like I said, I wasn't part of the administrative part of the group. We were seven people. Everybody had their own tasks. Mm. My task was, George, go pick up this dog. Go pick up this cat. There's, that was my task. Go, go deliver this adoption. And that, that was my involvement with the organization. And I, quite frankly, did it well. I still get a lot of message supports from people who adopted from, from, from us at, during the, the period of time I was involved. Who would have all um, the records? I, I don't know who would have all the records. And one of the seven point. people that you work with? Uh, I would assume somebody has the records. Mm. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this one's full of a whole bunch of it, but this is one of the best chaff and redirects we're going to see him do in the entire show. He does a preparatory breath and a delay at that's true, and there's a pause, there's a but implied. He goes to chaff and redirect on a grand scale. This is not just a lateral target. When I say chaff and redirect, I go bomb, ba bomb, ba bomb, ba bomb, till you pick up something on a lateral path and you follow that. It's like an aircraft throwing out flares and a missile following them. Here he does something much more powerful. He wraps himself in higher ground or holy good and that kind of thing. He talks about childhood, love of animals. I'm a sanctuary for the downtrodden animal. I, I was like, where's mom, apple pie, flags, that kind of stuff. That's all he's really missing. And I call this the house of chaff and redirect, not the house of misfit toys or whatever he's going to call it. His blink rate goes through the roof when he leaves that topic because he's hoping that he gets something. Then he does distancing language. I can attest that that is not true, not true, suddenly not a lie about stealing the pet rescue money. The language, when that language starts to extend, when his cadence slows and he puts space between the syllables, you should be suspicious anyone, somebody, anytime someone does something like that to you. Ask yourself why. It doesn't mean they're lying. It means they're giving themselves time, time for some reason to think or whatever. He also then does a cadence shift as he explains all of this entire thing. And he loses his capability to you to string a sentence together. He says it came as a surprise as much to you. His brain is trying to do two things at once and he loses it. Respiration and wide eyes when he's asked point blank what happened. And now he's in the compromised, he's in the compromised steeple. His hands are in front of him. And then he does another redirect back to, like I said, he's now the lackey for the group instead of being a guy who founded it. He's now the guy who they would tell to go do something and he would do it. And he almost makes the big mistake. He says the people who adopted from, 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 he almost said me. And that would have been an admission of guilt. Dog swindler, dog swindler, dog swindler. Scott, what do you got? All right. At first, he, like you were saying, he ran the thing because he says, you ran a thing. And he's like, yeah, I did. I ran that. But then he goes on to claim he knows nothing about it. Doesn't know, but he's a wonderful animal rescuer because he's got four dogs at home and they've got heart problems. They they're all messed up. But man, he's taking care of them because he rescued them. And we're just seeing him run a classic scam, and he's getting busted and not owning up to it, even though it's right there in front of him. And what we're seeing is that teeter totter between uh, not good and evil, but good and bad. So that's one thing to, to, that when you catch things like this, you hear somebody talking about something that's really good, then they end, they end up talking about something them being really bad involved in it. Something's up. So he's saying, I'm a wonderful guy who rescued animals. Then we juxtapose that against, but yeah, but I don't know where the money is. I didn't have anything to do with that. Doesn't, re, doesn't remember who to talk to. And he ran this thing. Doesn't know who these people are. Can't tell us where to go to see him. He never gets his, his, Back never comes up and he never says, hey, man, I didn't do this or I didn't do that. It's all of his happy face because he likes what he's doing. He enjoys doing this. And that's what you'll see as well. If somebody seems too happy the whole time, even when you push against them, heads up on that. We still haven't seen anything that's, that shows sorrow or regret or grief or anything in any of this stuff about him being busted lying. And he never, like I just said, he's never rears back and goes, hang on a minute, man and stops him from it. Never. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so look, if you if you have animals that you have rescued and, and you do that in order to help their, their suffering diminish, good for you, fantastic. I'm not sure that's what he's doing. 
I think he might collect suffering because the closer he is to suffering, the more, the closer he is to somebody who's suffered and the more prestige he can win, the more badges, the more pins he can wear and display around that suffering element. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick my neck out and go, um, you know, I, I hope those, his, his pets are well looked after, but even his charity is, is, is friends of what was it friends of pets united or something like that or friends of animals united so friends and united it's about the things outside the the entity that's actually got the problem it it isn't doesn't direct you even the title doesn't direct you to the thing with the problem and, and what does he do well he traffics around this suffering he was very good he says look i ran it he says first of all and then look this is this is a big problem because he then spreads responsibility well, you know, these people with a lot of people involved, a lot of people involved. That's a breaking baseline for him. He hasn't been saying, Hey, there were a lot of people involved. It's all about him. Suddenly, if he's now spreading responsibility, I now know, okay, there's some real trouble coming up here because he's not usually anybody who's going to spread the responsibility. He wants to take all the status of this. So he starts to spread this, this responsibility. And what's he left with? Just as you said, Scott, he's, he just w was very good at animal supply chain. That's, you know, just a little part of that animal supply chain. And he was wonderful at that, but he wasn't really organizing anything. Back to your point, Greg, I can attest that this is not true. Uh, that's a negative for a start. And it's a negative about attestation, which is proving or declaring or witnessing. So if you attest, you have proof, or you declare, or you witness, you saw it, all of which are positives. So instead of attesting that this is not true, what you do is just say what happened say in the positive what happened and just like murder in the trials last week he wants to answer this one in the negative yeah he wants to answer in the negative rather than saying this is what i can prove actually happened uh it's starting it's starting at this point to get troubling for me and it it's not going to disappoint <laughs> because this is going to get way more troubling as we go along uh who've we got left chase yeah chase yep. what do you got mark to your point in my uh notes here i have wound collector by proxy yeah exactly and i think that's what we're seeing and yep. right at the beginning of this little clip here he says a multitude of people i'm not sure he knows what a multitude means seven people is not a multitude but when he's talking about the group's uh, lack of filings and documents, this is what BS looks like. There's a total, complete loss of fluency here. He has trouble with his words, can't put a sentence together. The blink rate goes way up. And before, you might give him a little credit and say, well, he's on camera. You know, he's on camera. He might be nervous. He's on TV. He's getting interviewed. That's not what this is. This is a spike in blink rate. He's been on camera lots of times, and I've taken a look at many of those to make sure that this wasn't some skewed perspective here. Then there's hesitancy. He's pausing irregularly, according to his baseline. Before he speaks, there's an increase in speed and when people are deceptive, especially at the precise moments of stress and deception, they speed up their language to shorten the amount of time they're experiencing the stress of lying. And he says, I still get a lot of message supports from people. Direct quote from this clip. This strange mixing of words here is indicative of something that's super rehearsed messages. Uh, something rehearsed over and over again, these words, and you'll see this in new actors all the time, as I'm sure Mark could probably elaborate on. I wouldn't claim this alone is indicative of deception, but my money is on massive lying here. And there's so much being concealed, smoothed over. It's just too much to ignore. And you hear, you hear me say this on all of our videos, if you're a subscriber, pay close attention to what's not there. What is being smoothed over, skipped over, concealed or ignored in somebody's statement? The eyewitness is you. Your campaign bio claimed you ran a foundation called Friends of Pets United in New York and New Jersey that saved two and a half thousand dogs and cats over a five year period. 
that true? That's true. Um, but I wasn't alone in, in the operation. Uh, I had, there was a multitude of people. We were all volunteers. I was the operator. I was one of the, I think we were seven founders, if I'm not mistaken, between New York and New Jersey. Uh, my advocacy in, in animal uh, welfare and animal rights is, it stems from my childhood. I've always very compassionate towards animals. I own four dogs at home. They're all rescues to, to one sort. I call it the home of misfits. They're all unwanted, three legs, heart murmur, you know, the issues like that. And um, now everybody is, after all the revelations about the organization, I wasn't in charge of any of the... I mean, the weird thing is there were no social media accounts for it. No tax... Well, those were all deleted. Well, there were no the ones that anyone could find. No tax records, no evidence of the charity being registered in either New York or New Jersey. They did run one fundraiser with a rescue group in New Jersey in 2017 for which you charged a $50 entry fee, but the group which staged the event said it never received any funds. And I can attest that that is not true. The funds all ran through through the group and the the post of the of the facility was who was in charge of all of our of our filings. So this came to a surprise as much but as what happened to, me to the tax to records to the social media I, 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 was, I wasn't in charge of any of that. It was never set up as a charity even. Well I, I wouldn't know that. I was the operator. I was the guy putting cats out of the streets into my car, taking them to get. I understand that, but, but so I wasn't in charge of that. I know, but when you say you're the operator of this of this foundation, and there's literally no record of any of it, it doesn't doesn't lend yes. much credibility to your operational skills. Like, like I said, I wasn't part of the administrative part of the group. We were seven people. Everybody had their own tasks. Mm. My task was, George, go pick up this dog. Go pick up this cat. There's, that was my task. Go, go deliver this adoption. And that, that was my involvement with the organization, and I, quite frankly, did it well. I still get a lot of message supports from people who adopted from, from, from us at, during the, the period of time I was involved. Who would have all um, the records? I, I don't know who would have all the records. I mean, one of the seven point. people that you work with? Uh, I would assume somebody has the records. Mm. Let's turn to, I mean, I think some of the stuff like that is an arguable point. Um, potentially. Some of the stuff about your family life has caused, I would say, more offence if, as people believe, it wasn't true. And I want to turn to something that's obviously very personal to you, and that's your own mother. And uh, this question of whether she was working, as you claimed, in her office in the South Tower of the Twin Towers on September the 11th, and then passed away, as you said, a few years later, when she lost a battle to cancer. Now, there is no record of your mother, Fatima Devolder, ever having worked in the Twin Towers. So was that true? That's true. What, why is there no record of her working I, I, there? I don't know where people are looking or what they're looking for. But there is, a, as you know, because of what happened afterwards, there's a record of everyone that worked there. There's no doubt about who worked there. I'm sorry. Can't... Well, there's no doubt about who was there's working no in the There's no doubt of who worked in the buildings on the... There was a full uh, record done of yeah, everybody. Yeah, no, I'm very aware. So the way, the way that I look at this, and, and I've, I've rest this case before, and, and, and respectfully, mm. please, I won't debate my mother's um, life as she's passed in mm. 16, and I think it's, it's quite unsensitive for everybody to want to rehash my mother's legacy. Um, well, well, OK, but hang on. Here's what I would say to that. They're only doing that because you put this on your campaign website. I think if a politician is going to use the fact of his mother's death on 9... As a she result... She died on 9-11. She died a few years later. It was actually 15 years later. 15 years, yeah. But you're going to claim that she was in one of the towers on the day of that terror attack. I don't think it's unreasonable for the media to investigate that, to well, see if it's I true. Agree. And there is simply no evidence that your mother ever worked at the World Trade Centre. At all, and the NBC uh, News uh, looked into this and said the only known employer she had was at an imports business in Queens that folded in 1994. New York Times said she worked as a nurse in Brazil. Uh, two genealogists found documents that said your mother returned to Brazil by September 2001, and she was actually not even in America at the time. She applied for a visa to enter the U.S. in 2003, stated in the application she hadn't been in the U.S. since 1999. So all this points to her not being anywhere near the Twin Towers on September 11th. And I do think it matters because it's such an emotive part of modern American history. So I simply ask you, did your mother work there or did you just get that wrong? No, my mother was 
I was 13 years old in 2000, September 11, 2001. Mm. I was in the United States, so my mother was here because she had full custody of both her children. So it's... So did she lie on her, on her visa application? Uh, I don't know. I, I was a child when these things were being done, so I have no clue. And I, I have no recollection of my mother having obtained a visa if she had a green card and, and then uh, applied for citizenship later in life. So it, that's, that's alien to me. Now, you're asking also things that I wouldn't know I didn't know my mom had my mother had a business in 1994, so I'm just letting. Right, but, but specifically on the point of why nobody can find any evidence that your mother worked at the World Trade Center at all ever, could you just got this wrong? I mean, so are you telling me that I got wrong what my mother told me? I don't know. Is it possible she misled you? I don't believe so. She she wasn't one to mislead me. But there's no record that she was there that day at all. I stay and there's a record of every single person that was in both those towers. I stay convinced that that's the truth. You claimed it. All right, Chase, what do you got? So one thing you'll see in this clip here is half blinking. His eyes kind of close, but the, the pupil stays exposed. Just super weird. Uh, right when the topic of question comes out. So right when the topic comes out and he realizes what the question is about, there's half bleaking. This is out of baseline for him. It's out of baseline for most humans. And we tend to do this when there's a potential threat. The eyes are dry from stress, which is why our blink rate increases. But we have to focus on a potential threat in front of us. That's when you see this behavior. And his hands start squeezing together as the question comes out, hard enough to whiten his nails. And this is pacifying, self-soothing behavior. Call it whatever you like. And then his blink rate goes way up here during the question. And he's stressed, probably knowing the facts are not in his favor here. And knowing no one's going to definitively prove the negative, I think he's chosen to double down here instead of maybe admitting another lie. And... He says, I've rest this case before. None of you are nodding, so I'm guessing none of you are really going to jump into this. But I thought that was really, really interesting. I've rest this case before. I'm, I'm wondering what that is. And I'd love to hear your opinion, what you think it is. Put it down in the comments. I go through there and I read it. I'd love to hear what you think. But he initially says he's, he's not going to do it. Then he completely capitulates and reverses his position with Pierce. And this is indicative of deception. So I want you just to remember, truth both carries and insulates confidence. If, I, if you're confident on a topic, truth carries that confidence and insulates it from outside forces. So truth carries and insulates confidence. Second thing you'll see here, if, you, if you're noticing, if you're watching the eyes, is that when he blinks, his eyes move in another direction, and when his, he opens them back up, he has to refocus on Pierce when his eyes are reopening. So I called an uh, eye surgeon today, an ophthalmologist, sent him this clip, and he had a, had a look at it because I thought it was a neurological dysfunction. He took a look at it and said it was probably just a tick or some kind of a tick. And just in case you see that, I wanted everybody to know what that was. Scott, what do you Dang got? It. That, was, that was my big one. I was going to talk about how he had a tick with his eyes. Dead gummit. Anyway, uh, let's go back to his blink rate then anyway. His blink rate starts out, uh, goes through the roof. That's because when, this, when Pierce first starts with this, it's a big deal. And he knows it is because there's nothing true in here except the fact that he had a mother. That's the only true part of this as we go through this. Now... It's the most adapting we've seen so far. Like you were saying, Chase, we're actually seeing it in his hands now. Usually, what we've been seeing just a little bit here and there, just a little bit of movement. But now you're right. He's in there squeezing, trying to get rid of some of that built up stress and tension. His voice is, it, it stiffens up. His body stiffens up. And it, it's consistently through this, the lowest it's been so far through the whole thing. It's, it's as quiet as it's been because everything coming out of his mouth is a lie. I was going to say something. So this is the first time he's felt attacked, actually. And so he's re he's reacting differently because, it, number one, it's dealing with his mother. But this is when, when Pierce puts his head down and starts coming in for him for the attack. His voice gets quiet, and then it gets loud, then it gets quiet. It's, the whole thing is, is like breathing and letting go. It's become its own thing. It starts breathing and getting bigger and getting smaller and getting bigger and getting smaller. And these are the longest sentences we've heard from him so far. 
And these are the ones I was telling you, they're three times as long as the other ones. Some of them are really short uh, there at the beginning. But then when he gets going, the scene gets real, man, these things get bigger and bigger and bigger. And he's, and it's it's just qualifying the whole thing. And that's what he's trying to do is, is as he's explaining what happened. So these are just giant run-on sentences. There are no pauses in there. He just starts talking and going and going and going because that's what he's used to doing. That's what they'll do to try to get a, 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 It's a form of chaff and redirect. But that's what he's doing. He's just talking, 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 and and getting your mind off what's happening. It's almost like he's hypnotizing you with that, and then making his point about at at the end of those things. Um, a lot of eye blocking, a lot of those really long blinks. Um, it's the deepest breathing we've seen so far, and it's the the heaviest breathing we've seen so far. And he tries to ward it all off. He tries to and say he's no don't want to talk about it because it's his mother and she's passed, which is understandable. But that doesn't work either. Um, his voice tone and 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 for the most part, his tone and volume have gotten so low. He's like in full blown vocal fry for a lot of this. So that's that's I thought it was fairly interesting as well because the whole thing is a lie. So he's not really that animated about. It. That's why he's so still, and he's paying attention to everything being said so he can check those off as he goes down. Or are there any lists he needs to make to start checking those off? And he tries, but he didn't get very far with that. Then uh, toward the end, his, key, his cadence speeds up, and it speeds up faster than it's been so far. It's almost like an accordion. It's fast. It's slow. It's fast. It's slow. It keeps going in and out and in and out because this one's hitting close to home because there's no way out of this one. There's some other things that there's no way out of yet or, or when we talk about those. But up to this point, this is the one he's not going to be able to get out of, I don't think. So, And, and I think it'll come back and bite him again. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. So, um, so why why would a a consummate liar, uh, a, a habitual liar who's pretty confident with it, why should they f- be feeling so much stress around this particular moment? Well, um, there's a great treatise on lying written by Saint Augustine, and if you're into lying, and I, I would count myself as some authority on truth and lies. Uh, if you're into the idea of lying, you've got to read St. Augustine. And, and basically what he says is, look, some, some lies are worse than others. Okay. He kind of goes, they're all bad, but some are really, really bad and some not so bad. And some you'll really go to hell for. And some you might just get away with not going to hell is, 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 is a general praise of it. Worth reading. Uh, what about this particular lie? Well, I would put this particular lie under the category of stolen valor to an extent. Now, why would I do that? Well, there is literally a national monument around the two towers. It is a, it's rather like, in my view, that the the, the US gives itself a monument or even a medal of, of, of valor, essentially, around this, this event that happened. Because uh, the two towers event, there was suffering, tragedy, and most of all, there was horror. And I think... That's the wound, Chase, to your point, he wants to collect on this one by proxy, that he has undergone the suffering and the horror of that event through his mother, but more than chance, his mother was not at this event. And so to try and collect that badge, that pin, and pin it on himself via proxy is rather like showing up to Remembrance Day, you know, for us, uh, you know, UK uh, citizens, the British and the Irish as well, and and wearing medals that you simply did not did not achieve, uh, or are not your your family's medals in any way, which is which is, you know, in many cases, okay to do as well as display in some way, you know, a relative's medal that you're you're proud of. Now, uh, I love his idea of I stay convinced that that is the truth. I stay convinced that that is that is the truth. Well, I you know, let's have the facts. Like, give us the the, the sensible facts on that one. So, stolen valley valor here, which I think is 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 awful to see, but you know, could we give him the benefit of the doubt and go, okay, so is this kind of just a Walter Mitty kind of character who fantasizes and sees that the, the romance potentially in that event doesn't see the horror, doesn't see the tragedy, doesn't see the suffering there, sees the, the romance of it rather like some war films can be incredibly romantic and, and beautiful around the horror. And he wants a sense of that romance 
Well, it could be that. Or is it somebody who is so utterly ambitious for status, utterly voracious in their appetite for status, that they would pretend that they had a relative in a situation that all of us remember where we were on that date. I have great friends who on that date, when I'm signing up, I'm going to war, on that date, they walked down the office and said, count me in on this one. Extraordinary. So is he a Walter Mitty or is he voracious uh, and uh, for, for ambition? Extraordinary. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Let's talk about what he isn't. He is currently not a talented liar. In this case, he starts to lose not just verbal fluency. He starts to lose the ability to navigate lies very rapidly. If he didn't, he would say, that's all a misunderstanding. My mother was on the street when it happened. And she was impacted by it. Very simple explanation to walk away. And a lot of liars will do that. They'll find a, a, a hybrid agreement, but he doesn't. And it starts off with Piers Morgan kind of giving him a little bit of a bone. He says, some of that's arguable. Boom. He starts off by saying, potentially, maybe some of this. So the guy feels he's okay. And then when he starts to berate him, you see that blink rate go through the roof. You guys have already covered the compressions for the adapters in that sacred space. There are a couple of anomalies in his body language here. He doesn't do it any other time that I've seen when he says that is true and his brow rises. Hmm. Okay. That means that all these other things he's been lying about, this may even be more compound. There may not be a scrap of truth in it. I don't know, but something's up. Something is very different from the rest of his baseline on this one. Then he asks for a restatement of the question to give him time to think. And there's anger when he starts to talk about it being documented. He breaks eye contact down, and then he, his lower teeth are exposed. Then he takes that moral high ground to my mother's dead, and we're not going to talk about her life. Even he can't believe he just did that. And if you don't believe that, watch him ch chin down and throat protect. Two things are happening now, and we're going to start to see it happen more dramatically. He's going to develop this gorder looking thing here as his chin drops and his neck starts to swell out. I'm going to call that a vocal sack like a frog has, because we're going to see it become more pronounced and it's going to be telling with him. And then the other piece is he's doing the Wicked Witch of the West. He's shrinking, he's turtling, <laughs> he's melting. So, and Scott, I had to think of that because we just walked down the yellow brick road the other day when we were in the studio. Oh, so, yeah. I think the guy's a piece of work. That throat protection, when he's put on notice, is really powerful. Then he does a hard swallow. And look at that stupid smile he started with this thing. It's all gone. There's no more stupid smile here. If I were a sitting representative in the U.S. Congress and got to this point, I would probably find a way to get up and leave. Let, let me give you a piece of advice. If you're ever in this kind of a bind, knock your water over. Do something silly. It's called faux pas. Get yourself out of that situation. You're, there's no winning from where he's at here. When he starts to say her history is now a matter of, of fact, you put it out there, his respiration gets high, his eyes narrow. He does another elegant redirect attempt. He says, I was a child living here, so she must have been here because she had custody. Well, that's an assumption. That's not a fact. And then he does the ultimate, in my opinion, Mark, worse than the other lie is a lie of betrayal. He throws his mother under the bus. Are you saying my mother told me something that wasn't true? Wow. 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 Now he's a turtle. We're done. <laughs> yeah, I was reading the comments the other day, and yep. there was somebody in there that said, Scott, I think you may have Parkinson's. Be sure you need to go get that checked out. When I'm sitting here and I jiggle my leg when I get bored or we're doing yeah. something, I, I look at myself and I'm sitting there going like this. I was like, oh, because I went through, I look, why were people, it scared me to death. I was like, what are you talking about? And I can tell I'm sitting there doing it like that. And I was just looking like I've got something wrong with me. If I start doing that, y'all remind me and I'll quit shaking my leg. The eyewitness is you. Let's turn to, I mean, I think some of the stuff like that is an arguable point, um, potentially. Some of the stuff about your family life has caused, I would say, more offence if, as people believe, it wasn't true. And I want to turn to something that's obviously very personal to you, and that's your own mother. And uh, this question of whether she was working, as you claimed, in her office in the South Tower of the Twin Towers on September the 11th, and then passed away, as you said, a few years later when she lost a battle to cancer. Now, there is no record of your mother, Fatima Devolder, ever having worked in the Twin Towers. So was that true? That's true. 
Why is there no record of the work? I, I don't know where people are looking or what they're looking for. But there is, a, as you know, because of what happened afterwards, there's a record of everyone that worked there. There's no doubt about who worked there. I'm sorry. Can't... Well, there's no doubt about who was there's working There's no doubt of who, wor who worked in the buildings on the... There was a full uh, record done of yeah, everybody. Yeah, no, I'm very aware. So the way, the way that I look at this, and, and I've, I've rest this case before, and, and, and respectfully, mm. please, I won't debate my mother's um, life as she's passed in 16, mm. and I think it's, it's quite unsensitive for everybody to want to rehash my mother's legacy. Um, well, well, OK, but hang on. Here's what I would say to that. They're only doing that because you put this on your campaign website. I think if a politician is going to use the fact of his mother's death on 9... As a she result... She died on 9-11. She died a few years later. It was actually 15 years later. 15 years, yeah. But you're going to claim that she was in one of the towers on the day of that terror attack. I don't think it's unreasonable for the media to investigate that, to well, see if it's I true. Agree. And there is simply no evidence that your mother ever worked at the World Trade Centre at all. I mean, the NBC uh, News uh, looked into this and said the only known employer she had was at an imports business in Queens that folded in 1994. New York Times said she worked as a nurse in Brazil. Uh, two genealogists found documents that said your mother returned to Brazil by September 2001, and she was actually not even in America at the time. She applied for a visa to enter the US in 2003, stated in the application she hadn't been in the US since 1999. So all this points to her not being anywhere near the Twin Towers on September 11th. And I do think it matters because it's such an emotive part of modern American history. So I simply ask you, did your mother work there or did you just get that wrong? No, my mother was... I was 13 years old in 2000, September 11, 2001. Mm. I was in the United States so my mother was here because she had full custody of both her children. So it's... So did she lie on her, on her visa application? Uh, I don't know. I was a child when these things were being done, so I have no clue. And I, I have no recollection of my mother having obtained a visa if she had a green card and, and then uh, applied for citizenship later in life. So it, that's, that's alien to me. Now, you're asking also things that I wouldn't know. I didn't know my, mom had, my mother had a business in 1994. So I'm just letting... Right, but, but specifically on the point of why nobody can find any evidence that your mother worked at the World Trade Center at all, ever, could you just got this wrong? I mean, are you telling me that I got wrong what my mother told me? I don't know. Is it possible she misled you? I don't believe so. She, she wasn't one to mislead me. But there's no record that she was there that day at all. I stay And there's a record of every single person that was in both those towers. I stay convinced that that's the truth. You claimed, you claimed in a Conservative podcast in May 2022 that your grandparents survived the Holocaust. Your campaign bio again claimed that they fled persecution during World War II. And you told Fox News that you have Ukrainian heritage on your mother's side. Now, again, multiple family records show your maternal grandparents were born in Brazil. And a genealogist told CNN there's no sign of Jewish and or Ukrainian heritage and no indication of name changes along the way. So this is the one that I, I'll battle to my grave, uh, to the point that I've already ordered um, those DNA test kits and I've done four of them so far and I'm just waiting for their returns uh, and I'm very curious to share those with everybody because I grew up with, with the, the story was my grandfather was born in Ukraine when it was part of the Soviet Union, migrated to Belgium, met my grandmother. In, the in 1940 or 1941, they fled to Brazil where they falsified a lot of their documents to claim they were born there. Now, look, we're talking about a time in history where this was a very common occurrence in the name of survival. And it, it, this has happened to other people, and they were able to uncover it. And then apology letters were written. I've seen this happen in the community, in the mm -hmm. Jewish community, in organizations. And I, I will be that same story because you, I, I'm you, working on that right now. Okay, but you would understand that if that wasn't true, if your grandparents hadn't survived the Holocaust, that would be a pretty awful thing to that claim. Would be a, a why would I play with that? Well, that's, right. That's, well, you know, I'm, I'm one of the most staunch pro-Israel, most staunch pro-Judaism people in Congress today. Well, so much so you claim to be Jewish, but you're not Jewish. I, I never claim to be Jewish. I've always made, I've always made a party favor joke. You which claim was, to be Jewish, half Jewish, a proud American Jew, a Latino Jew, and a non-observant Jew. They're all direct quotes from you. So but You're not. You're Pierce, a Catholic. Like I've, me. I've, I'm a Catholic. Pierce, I've always made this as a 
party favor joke, and it's I've done it on stages across What's the country. What's funny about falsely no, claiming you're Jewish? No, 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 not falsely claiming I'm Jewish. I'd always say I'm. I was raised Catholic, but I come from a Jewish family, so that makes me Jew. Ish. But again, it's Congress, always been a party favor. Everybody's always laughed. I'm and sure now that do. everybody's I'm, canceling I'm sure me, I'm sure everybody's I'm pounding down for a pound of flesh. You, because you're not Jewish. Well, I, I never said I was. I've you always, did. I, you I've, basically I've, said you were. And I would always say, but my grandparents are Jewish on my mother's side, so I'm Jewish. Mm. That was always a joke. Everybody used to laugh it up. I said it to a room with a thousand people in November. People were hysterically laughing. It was funny to them. They loved it. I don't think Jewish people find it funny. Uh, they were Jewish. I was in a room with the Republican Jewish coalition. Do you think Jewish coalition. people find it funny that a U.S. congressman who's a Catholic with no apparent background of any Jewish heritage whatsoever, other than you say you have it, no one can find it. I think a lot of Jewish people would find that offensive. I, I, I beg differ when we were at the RJC in November. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Well, this one's pretty obvious. Uh, I showed my dog this video this morning and she <laughs> said, it's deceptive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think anybody watching can see the bait and switch. And I'll tell you exactly what the bait and switch is. But initially he says, this one he will battle for, as if to say the others are somehow less honest, but this one's honest. Uh, he dodges all the quotes from himself, his own quotes, and then redirects to a single instance of where the joke took place. So he's experiencing a loss of fluency, an increased blink rate, which we our blink rate, how often we blink, uh, speeds up when we're stressed out. There's increased adapting behaviors right there with his hands. The tone of his voice goes up sharply here at the very critical point here, and something's up. And if you just... Just use three things to go through any of these videos. These three things will turn you into a profiler. Number one, what's missing from this speech? Number two, what's being implied? And number three, what's the desired response? If you just go through, use those three filters and just turn off the video, listen to the audio only, and just go through those three filters, you'll still be able to profile these videos on your own of this guy. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, the, it just gets worse. I mean, I thought that this, in my mind, the stolen valor piece was was you know pretty big. Now the collecting of wounds, as you say, Chase, via via um, proxy, proxy through. And I've got it. I've got it right here through proxy, just here. Yeah, same victimhood through proxy, and now not even through the heritage of his mother. But through the her through a longer heritage and ancestry, trying to link himself. Uh, I mean, I said essentially, though he doesn't mention the Holocaust here. I believe that's what he's trying to link himself with. He's trying to link himself with the suffering that comes with a genocide. I, I would, I would suggest you might want to debate that, and he'd be very welcome to to come on our show and and, and debate exactly what he's trying to hint at here. Uh, but this one, he says he will battle to his grave. This is the hill he will, he's prepared to die on, uh, apparently, <laughs> apparently. And, and I think it's for somebody, here's the irony for me, for somebody who is such a friend of Israel. And so, you know, in his mind, connected with the, with the, the Jewish people, for him to say that they're all now demanding their pound of flesh, is an extraordinary irony. The pound of flesh references, of course, from the Merchant of Venice, comes from Shylock, uh, which many would would say is a, is a quite an anti-Semitic uh, character uh, that Shakespeare wrote. I don't think that's entirely true because Shakespeare actually sets it up quite well. That there's a very reasonable. Uh, it's very reasonable why this particular character has so much anger and, and vengeance. Shakespeare is generally a better writer than, than, than that. But essentially, the idea of wanting your pound of flesh is linked to the idea of the Shylock and the grasping, grabbing Jew. And so what he says is like, yeah, they all want their pound of flesh now. Well, if you really understood and was were, were was were well connected with the culture of the Jewish people, you wouldn't have used that idea, or you have no idea of the irony that you just set up, or you ha actually have zero care and idea 
of the, f not even a firework, this bomb that you're now holding in your hands and playing with, again, like a badge that you let wear on your lapel, a little pin that you can go, yeah, Jewish, look, I got the pin. There, give me that piece of, of suffering. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's disturbing. Were it my democracy, I, I don't think I'd want him in there. But look, you know, it's a democracy. You vote him in, you vote him out. Do what you like. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Oh, did you been? No? Ah, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm with you guys. This is, look, you don't need to be us to see this. All you need to do, let's, Chase talked about the sound. You can listen to his voice. You can hear the change to his voice, but you can also turn off all the sound and go watch him from the beginning to now. And look how small he's gotten. He's now, his vocal sac is swelling. You can see that big frog-like neck starting to grow. You can see his chin is down. And his smile is gone. He doesn't like the same person. He's milling his jaw. You can see right off the side here on the left, you'll see as he's chewing or clamping down, you'll see his jaw flex. He does a downright eye access. Now, there's not many close to absolutes we talk about, but when a person looks down to their right, they're typically associating that with emotional things. And then he goes, this is the one. And all I was thinking was, didn't he say something similar about the resume? Not his resume, but the resume. So, Okay, was that the one or this the one? Now, I'm also going to give him benefit of a doubt. Lots of family traditions can say we are. Elizabeth Warren, who was Native American and found out she's like 11,300, whatever the number is, it's, it's really low. My own mother always heard she had Cherokee ancestors. We had DNA tests. She was 3%. So that kind of thing can be part of your ancestry. That part's true. But you don't try to get an upper hand using it based on a family thing when everybody knows the DNA test exists. This is another one where the facts are starting to get to him. And let's give it a, for just a, a, a moment, give him the benefit of a doubt. Oh yeah, no, because little boy who cried wolf is a thing in our history or in our in our culture to remind us that when people lie all the time, they're likely not telling the truth when the time comes, probably not telling the truth. The only place I think he is telling the truth is about the joke, the one-time joke. Somebody brought it up, I think Chase, you did. And the reason I say that is because he does a chin jut and that's indignant and defiant. So I think he is telling the truth there. And that's the only place I think he's telling the truth. Scott, what do you got? This is where we see for the first time for sure that there's nobody in there. Because what he's talking about is unconscionable to connect himself to the Holocaust and say his grandparents were in that. And it, it's affected all. That's not that's not right. I mean, I'm Episcopal, but I feel for people that are dealing with that. Man, that's not good. You can't go around saying for that alone. They should they should say, hey, we need to stop. Somebody should have stepped in right there and said, hey, man, I'm sorry. You can't be a congressman anymore. You got you got to go for that alone. You should get that. I think that one's gross. And I'm not going to. So I won't go any further on that one. The eyewitness is you. You claimed in a conservative podcast in May 2022 that your grandparents survived the Holocaust. Your campaign bio again claimed that they fled persecution during World War II. And you told Fox News that you have Ukrainian heritage on your mother's side. Now, again, multiple family records show your maternal grandparents were born in Brazil. And a genealogist told CNN there's no sign of Jewish and or Ukrainian heritage and no indication of name changes along the way. So this is the one that I, I'll battle to my grave, uh, mm -hmm. to the point that I've already ordered um, those DNA test kits and I've done four of them so far and I'm just waiting for their returns uh, and I'm very curious to share those with everybody because I grew up with with this the story was my grandfather was born in Ukraine when it was part of the Soviet Union migrated to Belgium met my grandmother in the four, in 1940 or 1941 they fled to Brazil where they falsified a lot of their documents to claim they were born there now look we're talking about a time in history where this was a very common occurrence in the name of survival. And it, it, this has happened to other people, and they were able to uncover it. And then apology letters were written. I've seen this happen in the community, in the mm. Jewish community, in organizations. And I, I will be that same story because you, I, I'm you, working on that right now. Okay, but you would understand that if that wasn't true, if your grandparents hadn't survived the Holocaust, 
That would be a pretty awful thing to that play. That would be a Why would I play with that? Well, that's, right. That's, well, you know, I'm, I'm one of the most staunch pro-Israel, most staunch pro-Judaism people in Congress today. Well, so much so you claim to be Jewish, but you're not Jewish. I, I never claim to be Jewish. I've always made, I've always made a party favor joke. You which claim was, to be Jewish, half Jewish, a proud American Jew, a Latino Jew, and a non-observant Jew. They're all direct quotes from you. So but you're not. You're Pierce, a Catholic. Like I've, me. I've, I'm a Catholic. Pierce, I've always made this as a party favor joke, and it's, I've done it on stages across What's the country. What's funny about cl- falsely no, claiming you're Jewish? No, 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 not falsely claiming I'm Jewish. I'd always say, I'm, I was raised Catholic, but I come from a Jewish family, so that makes me Jew Ish. But again, it's Congress, always been a party favor. Everybody's always laughed. I'm and sure now that everybody's I'm, canceling I'm sure me, sure everybody's that. pounding down for a pound well, of flesh. You're, because you're not Jewish. Well, I, I never said I was. I've always, I, you I've, basically I've, said you were. And I would always say, but my grandparents are Jewish on my mother's side, so I'm Jew-ish. Mm. That was always a joke. Everybody used to laugh it up. I said it to a room with a thousand people in November. People were hysterically laughing. It was funny to them. They loved it. I don't think Jewish people find it funny. Uh, they were Jewish. I was in a room with the Republican Jewish coalition. Do you think Jewish coalition. people find it funny that a U.S. congressman who's a Catholic with no apparent background of any Jewish heritage whatsoever, other than you say you have it, no one can find it. I think a lot of Jewish people would find that offensive. I, I, I beg differ when we were at the RJC in November. In an interview um, with New York Public Radio following your election, you said you lost four employees in the Pulse nightclub mass shooting in 2016. I reported on that, it was horrendous. Uh, but none of the 49 victims at that Orlando club what to any of the companies that you've named in your biography? You said you lost four employees. Th- not, those are the not, people. Not, not, not four people who, who worked for you, four employees. Bad choice of words, and I'm not the only one guilty of that, but that's essentially the, the raw story of what happened. But no one could find any connection between any of the 49 victims and any of your companies. So where, where is the evidence for that? I, I would venture calling the company and, and asking them the, on the people, record. The media have done that. No, they haven't. They haven't been able to, to attain any contact with the company. Well, nobody can find any evidence. It is true. Like I said, I'm, I'm reporting based on uh, what was reported to us that morning. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, look, bad choice of words. I'm not the only one guilty of that. You're right. You're right. Um, you caught me bang to rights. I've been guilty of that as well. I've been guilty of that as well, but I'm not the one on TV right now who's lied about what you've lied about, made the bad choices of words that you've made the bad choices around. So I get to judge you just as like you can watch me right now and you can judge me. And that's that's the penalty. That's the penalty for doing private things in public, you know, publicly lying. You know, I can privately lie and you'd never know about it. But if I publicly do it, then you get to judge me just like you're judging me right now. And I like Mark or I don't like Mark. I wish he'd go away. I wish he'd do more and something in between. Yeah. You get to judge. That's the nature of privacy is very analog. And in the digital age, you don't get to be that private anymore. Uh, Listen, here's what I love about about this. And this is beautiful, beautiful propaganda in its perfect sense. When somebody says the raw facts or the raw intel or the raw file, we, we would often think, oh, you're talking about something that has been unadjusted, unredacted, and is devoid of narrative. It's absolutely raw. It's the raw ingredient. And he says, yes, that, that's the raw story. <laughs> that's the raw story. He puts two things together, which are the antithesis of each other, <laughs> rams them together and, and uses them to call his, his narrative uh, evaluation, his narrative evaluation, raw data, raw story. That is, that's brilliant that is brilliant and and that's maybe the only connection that kind of use of propaganda and ramming two words together that are opposites that's the only way i can link him to any of the atrocities of the second world war at this point you know that really is because that's a class that's a class act of propaganda that moment there it's 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 brilliant it's brilliant uh greg what do you got on this one yeah just a few a couple of things. When people ask for this in the beginning, I always said, eh, we stay away from politicians. But Mark, I think you brought it up one time, unless they do something really stupid in public and then we don't have a choice. Well, mm. welcome to the party. Um, this guy does blame sharing. I was told. 
I didn't do it. I was told that. So that's easy. Turtling, his head's starting to shrink and his neck is starting to swell out again. So we're starting to see more of that. He's getting smaller. That front, that smile is gone altogether. He uses something that I, in his shoes, would never use. And he says, he's in effect implying that your lack of ability to prove something means it must not be true. Well, hold on. Let's go back and look at your whole defense the entire time and everything he's had there. My mother's dead, so you can't prove anything, she said. I was always told by people, but. And then the last question I have for him, and I'm not going to do a lot of behavior. This is just listen to what he says. How does he know they didn't get a hold of the company? Anybody wonder that? How would you know? How would you know? Scott, what do you got? I'll, I'm with you on this. I'm going to go with, I'm, I'm gonna, not going to focus on body language much on this either. Um, but this is where it started to turn evil. He's taking the horror that happened in that place and he's taking it for, he's owning it for himself. Joe Navarro did a whole article on, um, on wound collecting. That's what he terms it as. And it would, and this is, this is horrible. And he's doing it and he's a gay fella and he's doing it to his own kind, his own, his own group, or however you say it correctly. He's turning on them. I can't believe that, that something had been done in that, in, from that group to go, hey man, what are you doing? Somebody straighten him out on that. So that's not good. I'm also going to in introduce here a new theory I have, and we'll start like this. What else has this guy done so far? He's been his mother was part of 9 9/11. Um, he's been a part of anything that has to do with pop culture, be it good, bad, whatever it is. He's had a a dog rescue. He's been. Everything he's the Forrest Gump of liars. That's who this guy is. He's done. He just happens to be there for all this stuff, and he's. It's impossible. It can't happen. So I'm going to go ahead and call this guy the Forrest Gump of liars at this point, and then we'll move on. Chase, you stole you my rap. You stole my oh, rap. That was my. Oh, rap. sorry, man. <laughs> so, well, apparently I'm 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 not wrong. You're on. You're that. dead on. <laughs> so, all right, Chase. What do you got? She tastes like cigarettes. <laughs> Please take that out. You're not going to take that out. All right. I'll take, so it. First, I'll take it out. So first, he says it was a bad choice of words, then changes it to someone else told him that. So it's either it's either one or the other. It's a bad choice of words on your part, or somebody else did tell you that. So second here, he's the only one who can get in touch with the company. So why didn't he offer to do that? Third, all he needs to do is provide the names of these victims. That's it. And from several other clips I was able to look at on the plane on the way home here uh, last night, it, it seems he's got a really strong desire, uh, Scott, to your point, to be directly connected and involved in everything that was significant. Anything significant and painful to our country or any country. This is often called grandiosity by psychologists. And the, the newer emerging models of, of narcissism it, it, since 2017 suggest that grandiosity and vulnerability in narcissism uh, can further just be differentiated into three factor structures. So the first one is called exhibitionistic grandiosity. We might be seeing that here. The second one is entitlement. We might be seeing that here. And the third is false vulnerability or vulnerability, which we're seeing here. And there's one paper from, from the APA, the American Psychological Association, that also talks about these factors becoming more exaggerated after facing periods of social rejection. That may look familiar here. And I'd go out on a limb here and say that that's what he's probably facing right now. So we'll see what happens from a future behavioral perspective in light of these you know, these papers that were published. The eyewitness is you. In an interview um, with New York Public Radio following your election, you said you lost four employees in the Pulse nightclub mass shooting in 2016. I reported on that. It was horrendous. Uh, but none of the 49 victims at that Orlando club what to any of the companies that you've named in your biography? You said you lost four employees. Th not, those are the not, people. Not, not four people who, who worked for you, four employees. Bad 
choice of words, and I'm not the only one guilty of that, but that's essentially the, the raw story of what happened. But no one could find any connection between any of the 49 victims and any of your companies. So where, where is the evidence for that? I, I would venture calling the company and, and asking them the, on the, the people, record. The media have done that. No, they haven't. They haven't been able to, to attain any contact with the company. Well, nobody can find any evidence. It is true. Like I said, I'm, I'm reporting based on uh, what was reported to us that morning. You angrily denied. This is another one where it's quite interesting because a, I don't know why you would deny it when it was clearly turned out to be true, um, particularly after all the fury that had gone on. But you angrily denied being a drag artist after a Brazilian <laughs> drag queen posted a picture of herself with you. You said the most recent obsession from the media claiming I'm a drag queen or performed as a drag queen is categorically false. It is. It's not, though, is it? Pierce. Seen the pictures. I, oh, hold on. I go out. So, so if I was a drag queen, I was the poorest drag queen in the world because I had well, one outfit you, in one day. I'm not saying you the were the shortest lived career. I'm not saying you were a good drag queen. I'm just saying you clearly dressed up in drag. Once. Oh, sorry. Okay. So it's like me saying, Rudy I'm, not, Giuliani I'm not a murderer, up. I only kill one no, person. No, I understand, I mean, but Rudy Giuliani dressed up in drag. It's not a what about me. Is he, is he a drag queen? I've got a lot of questions for Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> here's my point. He dressed up in drag. Look, here's my point. Why, no, here's my point. Why deny it? I didn't why attack, deny it. Why attack the obsessive media for publishing a truth? Because the media is not telling the truth. The media is portraying to You've the American... You've just American, they are. They, they're... They're portraying to the American people that I'm a drag performer, a career drag queen, which is offensive to drag queens, by the way. Mm. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure most of the drag queens in New York Here's City Here's why they think that. Here's why they think that. Not just because you've admitted you dressed up in drag, but a 2011 Wikipedia bio for a user named Anthony DeVolda, one of your pseudonyms, mm, claimed, that not following, mine. claimed that following a successful drag career, you landed roles on Disney Channel shows like Hannah Montana <laughs> and a role in a movie called The Invasion starring Uma Thurman. Now, Either you did that under your pseudonym, which you have told me you use, or somebody has gone away and created their own Wikipedia bio using one of your pseudonyms to invent all this. Why would they do that? I had no notion, idea, or even... I didn't know this... Wikipedia page existed. Why would someone invent you and, and pretend to be you I'm, in 2011? I, I, I'm making, or anyone knows who you are? I'm making this very clear. I have no clue. I have no ownership of that page. Weird, though, right? Weird. There's someone... Pierce. This is, this is 12 years ago. Pierce, my point is. No one knows you, who you are. I never... A, never tried to be an actor, never pretended to be an actor. B, mm. I was never career drag queen. I did once. I dressed up in drag. I well, once paid Once we've seen photographs. But, I mean, is, is it likely... I mean, again, look, I don't care if you dress up in drag. <laughs> doesn't make any odds to me. No. Why do I care? Uh, look, here, right? here's my question for you. A, it's unlikely you did that only once, if I may be so bold you can, as to you can, that. You, you can say that. It's just that only once have we got photographic evidence, right? Pierce, I think it's, it's, it's just... Uh, to me, it's almost amusing that people are trying to fight me of being something that I'm not, that, quite frankly, if I were to say, oh, yeah, I'm a drag queen, that would probably give me redemption points, which I'm, I'm not willing to take it, because then I'd be admitting to a lie just to cover myself for the media. So I feel like what you guys want me to do is admit to something I haven't done. I said, let me tell you what I want you to do. <laughs> I simply want you to be honest. I don't give a damn. That, well, that's what I'm trying to tell you yeah, here. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so here we're going to see something he's prepared for. He knows, you can see his smile comes back up, but his, his in the beginning of it, he is happy, and then his eyes narrow, the smile goes away, and you see almost tears. Is that frustration? I can't tell. It looks like he may have some duper's delight come up. As that left side of his smile comes up, maybe it's contempt, not sure which. But I think he thinks he can defend this one because he's got all the right words. And you hear him do a masterful chaff and almost a redirect. He now conditions the question as whether he's a professional or amateur. There, that's a big deal. And then he he um, and, and he parks that very quickly and then moves on and talks about being a career drag queen. That's a big deal because that's an incremental and rapid redirect what he's done is throw out something take a quick turn and now he's going to park that and go another way and then he creates coalition with other drag performers to take it one step further from the accusation and make it about something else he's doing a really really good job of chaff and redirect but Piers morgan is not having any part of it and he cuts him off and that's the way you kill a chaff and redirect he does a great job that's one of the best we've seen anybody do in any of these then he does this all-out cluster of all clusters 
deviation from what we've seen. There's a Biden smile. <laughs> you know, when you defend yourself using a Teflon smile to get rid of things, there's a tongue jut. And then he starts to attack that faked um, resume, the thing he calls a faked resume. That's a lot of effort to defend something that you simply could say that never happened. That's that. That's all you got to say. A lot of noise around that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, this is this is brilliant because look, Piers, uh, you know, has been a naughty boy in the past. He knows that. We know that. He can be a real pain and be brutal to some of the wrong people now and again. But here, my hat's off to him. I think he's brilliant because he's a real student of behaviour. Here, he's he's got this uh, this idea of of look, you know, I only did this uh, once. And, and Piers says, no, it's unlikely that you only did that once because behavior tells us, behavior tells us, as I've always said, once is a pattern. If you see somebody do something once, you can gamble big money that they've done it in the past or they will do it again in the future. It is a really good leading indicator of a history or what's to come. Uh, and and a great one to just remember in in politics. If you ever if you ever work in politics, as I have done, and I have been there with with a photograph and gone, oh, okay, that's an interesting photograph, and thought to myself, there's more of those. We only have one of them. There's more of those, and it's turned out to be true. If you have one piece of evidence there's likely more evidence out there. And so be careful how you play that evidence because you're not the only one holding a card. You may think you have the ace, but other people hold cards as well to that behavior. And I, I would agree with Pierce. Um, you know, not, not there's anything wrong with that behavior. I think it actually, he actually looks really quite fantastic. I mean, you know, do, if that's him and, and it possibly is, I mean, all credit to him. Looks, looks, looks really quite good, really quite excellent. Uh, you know, I hope there is more out there because looks like he's doing a good job there. I would prefer him at this point as my my drag queen act than as anybody in authority. Um, I think he'd hold great authority on the on the stage, um, and and sh probably shouldn't have any authority in politics right now, Sim not because of the drag thing, just because he's a barefaced liar. I mean, just barefaced. <laughs> I mean, there's liars out there, but he's he's something else. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so I, I agree with you that this is not the classic deception scenario, but let's break down the behaviors here because this is not uh, deception per se by the legal term. But we have a blink rate starts spiking right away, right when the question starts coming out. This is an indicator of stress. Then right at the words notion and idea, uh, he's using those words, the notion, the idea. He's changing the definition as he's moving forward, which is, I think, accidentally masterful. Then we see a loss of fluency here. And... Uh, He's saying, I didn't know this Wikipedia page existed. No clue, no ownership of that page. He's unable to uh, unable to agree that it's weird. He, all Pierce wants him to do is agree that it's a weird thing. It's weird. So he's unable to even do that. This is where we're going back to what's concealed, what's withheld, what's the intent. And he denies trying to be an actor. Why? I, he's not denying the actual thing. He's denying the trying to be an actor. And he's making an admission to something on the page, not denying creating the page at all. He never denies creating that page. And he's saying, I dressed up once. Look at this hand when he's saying, I dressed up one time. The fingers are rigid and stiff and just being restrained as if they're just waiting to come up and show more. And as a quick note on this, he has counted on his fingers in at least five other occasions and in interviews that I was able to find. Uh, I was unable to look at any behavior even remotely resembling this. So this is a very unusual change in behavior for him. And right at the end, I just want you to just, I'm just going to give you what he says in response to the question. I want you to analyze this on your own as a 
subscriber, as a panelist. Piers Morgan just says, I want you to be honest. And the response from him is, that's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> you can analyze that uh, any way you like. I'd like to hear your response. What what you think uh, while you're watching the show. Greg? Hey, Ch Chase, yeah, I've already gone, but one thing. Oh, that's right. He's count. He's counting this way until he says I only did it one time. Yes. In the same video, the exact yeah. same video. So you're dead on. Scott. Yeah. All right. Uh, the key here is where Pierce says, why would someone invent you? Why would someone invent you? He invented himself. That's what's happened here because there's nobody in there. There's nobody there. Kafka said, or, and I always use this, but he said, every man is necessarily the hero of his own story. This guy wants to be a hero so bad, going back to what Chase was saying at the beginning, there's something wrong there at the beginning of him that has made him want to, to do all these things. And, and this grandiosity of his personality type, all these things, the narcissism, hating himself, that's where all this is rooted from. That's the key right there. Why would someone invent you? He invented himself. He's done it all. And... Though Forrest Gump was, was told from a third person's perspective, this is told from his first person's perspective, going back to Kafka. So there's a lot of heavy stuff going on with this cat, man. He's, he's, this, I think it could be dangerous at some point. If he hasn't been already, we just don't know. So I'd keep an eye on that guy. The eyewitness is you. You angrily denied. This is another one where it's quite interesting because a, I don't know why you would deny it when it was clearly turned out to be true, um, particularly after all the fury that had gone on. But you angrily denied being a drag artist after a Brazilian drag queen posted a picture of herself with you. You said the most recent obsession from the media claiming I'm a drag queen or performed as a drag queen is categorically false. It is. It's not, though, is it? Pierce, same the pictures. I, oh, hold on. I go out. So, so if I was a drag queen, I was the poorest drag queen in the world because I had well, one outfit you, in one day. I'm not saying you the were the shortest lived career. I'm not saying you were a good drag queen. I'm just saying you clearly dressed up in drag once. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's like me saying Rudy I'm not a, I'm not a murderer. Up. I only kill one. No, person. I understand. I mean, but Rudy Giuliani dressed up in drag. It's not a what a Is mean, he is he a drag queen? I've got a lot of questions for Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> here's my point. He dressed up in drag. Look, here's my point. Why, no, here's my point. Why deny it? I didn't why attack, deny. Why attack the obsessive media for publishing a truth? Because the media is not telling the truth. The media is portraying to you just the American. You they are. They, they're. They're portraying to the American people that I'm a drag performer, a career drag queen, which is offensive to drag queens, by the way. Mm. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure most of the drag queens in New York Here's City why they think that. Here's why they think that. Not just because you've admitted you dressed up in drag, but a 2011 Wikipedia bio for a user named Anthony DeVolda, one of your pseudonyms, mm, claimed, that not following, mine. claimed that following a successful drag career, you landed roles on Disney Channel shows like Hannah Montana <laughs> and a role in a movie called The Invasion starring Uma Thurman. Now, Either you did that under your pseudonym, which you have told me you use, or somebody has gone away and created their own Wikipedia bio using one of your pseudonyms to invent all this. Why would they do that? I had no notion, idea, or even... I didn't know this... Wikipedia page existed. Why would someone invent you and, and pretend to be you I'm, in 2011? I, I, I'm making, or anyone knows who you are? I'm making this very clear. I have no clue. I have no ownership of that page. Weird, though, right? Weird. There's someone... Pierce. This is, this is 12 years ago. Pierce, my point is. No one knows you, who you are. I never... A, never tried to be an actor, never pretended to be an actor. B, mm. I was never career drag queen. I did once. I dressed up in drag. I once paid Once we've seen photographs. But, I mean, is, is it likely... I mean, again, look, I don't care if you dress up in drag. <laughs> doesn't make any odds to me. No. Well, I don't care. But look, here, right? but here's my question for you. A, it's unlikely you did that only once, if I may be so bold you can, as to you can, that. You, you can say that. It's just that only once have we got photographic evidence, right? Pierce, I think it's, it's, it's just... Uh, to me, it's almost amusing that people are trying to fight me of being something that I'm not, that, quite frankly, if I were to say, oh, yeah, I'm a drag queen, that would probably give me redemption points, which I'm, I'm not willing to take it, because then I'd be admitting to a lie 
just to cover myself for the media. So I feel like what you guys want me to do is admit to something I haven't done. I said, let me tell you what I want you to do. <laughs> I simply want you to be honest. I don't give a damn. Oh, well, that's what I'm trying to tell you yeah, here. But the, you reportedly told donors you were a producer on Spider-Man and Broadway. <laughs> is that true? No, I never said that. Not true. I never said that. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still trying to ask. I've asked the reporters, tell me who the donors were that I actually... Well, that's categorically untrue. I I never said to anybody I produced a Broadway show, and if you look at the timeline, I think I would have been 21 years old. <laughs> well, you claimed a lot of things in your life, <laughs> Congressman. Um, one month after you were elected, you claimed on a Brazilian podcast you'd already suffered an assassination attempt and that you described being mugged on Fifth Avenue in 2021. I was mugged on Fifth Avenue in 2021. Was there any police record? No, that? there was no police record. You didn't report it? There was no, pol there was no police in sight. 2021, this was... A, a zombie land out here. Oh, but did you report it? No, I did not. I got up, went into the car, defeated, upset, because I had experienced one of the most what, horrific what things. What happened to you? They took my briefcase and my shoes. Who did? Two guys. Took your briefcase and your shoes? That's it. They jumped you on Fifth Avenue? That's it. I was crossing the street, not Fifth, pardon me, Sixth, and if that reported Fifth, right. Sixth, because I, would, I worked on, the fifth, on 55th and Sixth Street Why on didn't the A&B building. Why did you report to the police? You know, Pierce, I don't know. I felt defeated, embarrassed. I'm a six foot tall guy that couldn't defend himself from a briefcase in my shoes. Do you know how humiliating that is? Mm. Do you know how, fear, how much fear gets instilled in you? I just finished running across the street into the garage where the, my car was parked, picked up my car and left. I'm lucky my phone was in my pocket so I could, uh, you know, just do the, the phone payment on the, or else I wouldn't have money to take my car. To the and pocket. what about the assassination attempt? When was that? It wasn't an assassination attempt. It was a death threat. This is poorly translated Portuguese to English language. It was a death threat. It was a death threat. It was several death Nobody threats. Nobody tried to kill you. No, and I've never claimed somebody tried to kill me. These were several. Uh, we had a several series of death threats following. So this Brazilian podcast has you saying already suffered an assassination attempt. That's well. That's been badly translated. This is poor translation. So we go back and we listen to the original. Please do. I. I. I it I, wouldn't have you saying you'd I, already suffered an assassination I, I, attempt. I encourage you. Yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't have you saying those words. It, it has me clearly saying that I suffered an, uh, uh, um, death threats throughout the process of running for office. Something along those lines, but no assassination. Attempt. Okay. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is way out of baseline, way out of baseline. He's doing worm on a griddle now. He doesn't know where to go. So he's pr brought a new tool out of his bag of tricks. I'll just do what I call trancing, what we call trancing in the true crime workshop. Usually we say it's emotional. You rock and you do something so that you're not available. It's simply a way of having something happen that makes you not available for questioning. He's doing it through amusement. If you notice, this part of his face is smiling, not his eyes. So we know that part's not true. This is all an act. This lower face is smiling. It's really bad acting for laughing. And Mark, I know you'll probably cover it better than I do there. But we're really getting close to worm on a griddle. When he talks about mugging, I have one question. Did they bring bleach? <laughs> Just because. And then when he gets to where he says, they took my shoes, I was defeated. I almost am done right there. So let me just hand that off to you, Mark. <laughs> uh yeah, look, I mean, th I think there's a, there's a non-contraction there. I, I did not, but I'm going to put that down to accent, essentially. Uh, I think that's part of his speech pattern. Uh, he corrects 5th Street to 6th Street. And so there is something interesting for me that he is willing to correct the story here. Now, um, and he does go for more of a an emotional relationship with the humiliation and the and the what would be a debilitation uh, just so you know you know one thing that you'll do with a crowd of people to calm them down is take their shoes if you can get hold of their shoes um you know there's they're they're a lot less frisky than they would be before and i'm sure greg and chase you've experienced that with with incarceration and holding people um so it's interesting. So on this story here, on this story here, I'm, I am, I, I imagine he has been, he has been mugged in New York because, you know, potentially who hasn't, you know, uh, a lot of people I know from New York would carry a mugging wallet with them, you know, one, one, the real one and one to give to the, the, the mugger, you know, before, before 9-11, it was quite a, quite a place. Um, a little easier maybe now. I don't know. I don't live there, but, uh, but from what I hear, but, uh, 
So I don't know. Chances are, chances are he's see, he's he's got into trouble in in New York now. Uh, has this em- embellished somewhat? Well, quite probably, possibly, given who we've got here and how they embellish. But is there a core here of something that actually happened? There's the probability that there's a, a core there. And I think the probability for me comes from that he's willing to go, no, it wasn't. If, if you, you're you hearing Sixth Street, it wasn't. It was, it was Fifth Street or he changes Fifth to Sixth or vice versa. I can't remember which one. So in, in this sense, this is probably for me, possibly the most honest <laughs> that, he's, that he's being at, at something of a core thing that happened there. That's the best I got on this one. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. When he's asked if the question is true or not, he doesn't say no. Dostoevsky wrote this book called The Brothers Karamazov. And when you when you read this, it's a hard read because there's so many dang commas. There's so many sentences that feel like they're run-on sentences. And the paragraphs are huge. And they just keep going and going and going. But there's so many commas in this dang thing. That's what we're seeing here. He's just throwing. It's like chaff and redirect. He's just throwing everything out there from laughing to jumping around. Everything he can get. He throws it in there. It just keeps going and going and going. And there's little that there's commas in what he's doing, referring back to other stuff and telling you about stuff about what he just said. It's it's crazy. So let's take a look at what we're dealing with here. Also, we're dealing with an immigrant Wall Street whiz slash movie producer who's the grandchild of Holocaust survivors, whose mother was involved in 9-11. And not only was there an assassination attempt on his life. He's a drag queen and an animal activist. This, I'm telling you, back to my... You forgot, you forgot, you forgot. He is also a self-made guy because he had to drop out of school because they were poor. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay, we'll add that in there too. Good call, good catch. Uh, So this is where we, we see him doing what he's done all of his life. This out of nowhere comes this thing and just like, What's up here? And he has to 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 just go off. He wasn't ready for this one. That's why he's so freaked out about it. That's why he's making such a big show about it. He loves what he's doing, but we're not seeing joy here. We're seeing him in a panic here. This is what he looks like when he's not doing well, when, he, when he's lying. He's having to come up with stuff. He's having to redirect everything. He's putting up all these walls and blocks, all these commas in there to make it confusing so he can get his story out about what really happened. So that's why we see all kinds of things in here. We see almost everything in here. We see chaff and redirect, romancing, turtling, barriering, incongruent, illustrating, fading facts, eye blocking, torso um, protection. We're seeing uh, he's moving back when he's when he's answering, speeding up of his cadence, slowing down of his cadence. His vocal volume goes up and down. A dramatic change in, in vocal tone. His blink rate goes way up and it goes way down. His, his breath rate is skyrockets at some points in there. Increased um, eye lock, eye gaze. He's just locked on him half the time to make sure that he's believing so he can read what's happening with Pierce so he can uh, see if he needs to add anything else. It just goes on and on and on. And I'll, I'll leave it there. All right, Chase, what do uh, you got? So when the question about the assassination attempt comes up, I want you, I'm going to leave out all the other body language stuff. I want you watching this because this clip is about to replay as soon as I'm done talking right here. I want you to watch the subtle change in his face the moment that he realizes what the question is about. So pay attention to it. If you have to, I want you to rewind it and watch it a few times and memorize it. This is a shift that happens when a topic is introduced that poses a grave threat to someone. And when I coach investors who get pitched all the time to ask CEOs questions about their company and their EBITDA and all that other stuff, this is the first thing that I teach them to look for. There's increased uh, force of gravity on the face. You see kind of the things just kind of fall on the face. There's a sudden change. Then the eyes drop downward a little bit while the person goes into focusing on what's going on, but they keep you in their peripheral vision. And that's a big detail to notice right here. And it all happens simultaneously. And you can see it in one second when he realizes what the question's about. So when you're, when he's presented with this mugging and assassination attempt, he ignores the assassination attempt, confirms the mugging, 
this is one of those times I tell you to look for what's being hidden, concealed, or missing. That's it. It's like right in your face in this clip. So I called a professional Portuguese translator today, and I sent them the entire podcast and had them directly translate this, and specifically this one piece, into English, of course. And here's what they wrote me back, and I'm quoting we have already suffered an attempt on my life in Portuguese and an assassination attempt. And I also quote, a six-year-old would understand this. It is in the clearest language possible in Portuguese. I'll just leave it at that. Let, let me add one, one thing to your list of things he is, Scott. He's a magnificent cell phone hider because they took his shoes and his briefcase but left him his cell phone. Oh, I had to add that. Yeah. Shoot, I should add qualifier. The island is you. But the, you reportedly told donors you were a producer on Spider-Man and Broadway. <laughs> is that true? No, I never said that. Not true. I never said that. I'm still, I'm still trying to ask. I've asked the reporters, tell me who the donors were that I actually... Well, that's categorically untrue. I never said to anybody I produced a Broadway show, and if you look at the timeline, I think I would have been 21 years old. <laughs> well, you claimed a lot of things in your life, <laughs> Congressman. Um, one month after you were elected, you claimed on a Brazilian podcast you'd already suffered an assassination attempt and that you described being mugged on Fifth Avenue in 2021. I was mugged on Fifth Avenue in 2021. Was there any police record? No, there was no police record. You didn't report it? There was no, pol there was no police in sight. 2021, this was a, a zombie land out here. Oh, but did you report it? No, I did not. I got up, went into the car, defeated, upset, because I had experienced one of the most what, horrific things. What happened things. to you? They took my briefcase and my shoes. Who did? Two guys. So your briefcase Two big guys. and your shoes? That's it. They jumped you on Fifth Avenue. That's it. I was crossing the street, not Fifth, pardon me, Sixth. And if that reported Fifth, right. Sixth, because I, would, I worked on, the fifth, on 55th and Sixth Street Why on didn't the A&B building. Why did you report to the police? You know, Pierce, I don't know. I felt defeated, embarrassed. I'm a six foot tall guy that couldn't defend himself from a briefcase in my shoes. Do you know how humiliating that is? Mm. Do you know how, fear, how much fear gets instilled in you? I just finished running across the street into the garage where the, my car was parked, picked up my car and left. I'm lucky my phone was in my pocket so I could, uh, you know, just do the, the phone payment on the, or else I wouldn't have money to take my car to the garage. And what about the assassination attempt? When was that? It wasn't an assassination attempt. It was a death threat. This is poorly translated Portuguese to English language. It was a death threat. It was a death threat. It was several death Nobody threats. Nobody tried to kill you. No, and I've never claimed somebody tried to kill me. These were several, uh, we had a several series of death threats following. So this Brazilian podcast has you saying already suffered an assassination attempt. That's, well, that's been badly translated. This is poor translation. So we go back and we listen to the original. Please do. I, 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 it I, wouldn't have you saying you'd I, already suffered an assassination I, I, attempt. I encourage you. Yeah? Yep. So it wouldn't have you saying those words? It, it has me clearly saying that I suffered an, uh, uh, um, death threats throughout the process of running for office, something along those lines, but no assassination. Attack. Okay. One of the more serious allegations against you, I felt, was that you stole money from a disabled veteran who contacted you to help fund life-saving surgery for his service dog. This is a man called Richard Osthoff. Um, he says that you raised cash on GoFundMe but refused to hand over the money. And AP says the FBI is now investigating this. What is the truth of this? I've never met this man. A lot, like, I've been abundantly clear. I feel for him, I feel for his story. I am as compassionate and, and as passionate about helping veterans and animals as this is the next guy. I, when I read this, it, it just it hit me like a bag of bricks because I don't know him. And most people who know me, who truly know me, Pierce, knows that if he had met me, his dog would have received the surgery. He wouldn't be homeless. The fact that he was homeless and anybody trying to help him address, wouldn't address the homeless issue was a bigger problem for me. And I mean that wholeheartedly. So you've never set up a GoFundMe page? No, I've, set not up, I've set up dozens of GoFundMe no pages. No one will find it. one that relates to Let this particular Let me make this very thing. clear. I've set up numerous GoFundMe pages throughout the years for, for, for animals in needs. Many of them who were not managed by me, they were managed by other people, but because I was the main account holder on the Facebook page, it would all go through So you're through not mine. denying there could be a GoFundMe I'm not page. denying there could be a GoFundMe page, but right. I'm denying... And what happened to that money if there is? Like I said, 
I'm not denying if there's a GoFundMe page and if they're going to present me with one, mm -hmm. I'm not going to deny that. But I've never met him. I've never took on this case and I never took the money from his dog. All right, Mark, what do you got? Okay, so uh, back to the eye blocks on, on this one again that we were seeing straight off. Blink rate up again. I mean, we've seen his blink rate, you know, up. But for me here, it starts to really peak. I never met this man. Well, so that's distancing. This man is distancing. Uh, I never met him. Well, that doesn't mean that you don't have links to him or links to the issue. You're not denying links to him or links to the issue. So uh, for me, there's there's something up here. There is that he's he's involved in this in in some way, very maybe very very directly or indirectly, but still linked and wanting to deny even uh, any link. Uh, Greg, what do you think of this one? What you got? Yeah, just a few things. You've covered most everything I have because he never denies he did it. He just says, I didn't know him. I never met him. Uh, so what? Most of these guys are never going to meet anybody. Redirected higher ground about homelessness. Instead of talking about, no, I didn't do this to his dog. He goes, well, if he's homeless, blah, 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 blah. and he takes, that's another redirect. He tries. He His adapting is increased, moving those fidgeting, those fingers, his chin is down, he's turtled, and he's that goiter, that vocal sack is back. So here we go. That's all that looks like deception to me. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, shoot, you guys covered everything on that one. But I will say what I thought was interesting, he said he didn't take the money from his dog. Did I ever take the money yeah. from his dog? Yeah, exactly. What the hell? <laughs> so that's where I'll, I'll and Chase, what do you got? So right here, he immediately gets really nervous. His hands are ringing. These are pacify gest uh, pacifying gestures, super strong indicator here. Then there's eye closure while he's answering. He's closing his eyes while making the denial with this extremely strong exhale, this really powerful exhale that we have seen nowhere else except for this one here. And Mark, you're right on the on the blink rate there. I counted it. It increased to 65 blinks per minute was the blink rate there. And just to keep just to give you a little perspective, our average blink rate is around 15, give or take. So that's that's a big deal. And when he says I've never met this man, that's not a denial at all. And when he's talking about the GoFundMe here, there's backtracking, a loss of fluency, and something that I call responsibility shedding. So he's shedding off the responsibility. Somebody else was in charge of that. Somebody else was doing that. It's my bank account. He said it was his account uh, that everything was linked to. So just, just as an example, here's what an honest human being might do. Number one, take a look at the account. Number two, maybe talk about how they searched for that page because they were concerned that it might be theirs. Three, deny or completely deny the accusation. Four, care about finding out who did this to the veteran five maybe ask to help that veteran because there's a veteran in need right there six maybe find out who he is and help that person uh seven take a look through the finances since it's your account as the primary account holder and locate the funds figure out what happened this i don't say this often this is absolute bs and it pissed me off to no end so I looked this guy up who got screwed over by this guy. I contacted him today. And just since we've been filming, he's texted me. Uh, he's doing well. Uh, he's not homeless. He had a doctor's appointment today and he is being taken care of. And I am personally going to help him get the service dog, get a new service dog within the next 60 days. So I reached out to him this morning. I talked to his dad actually for the first 10 minutes of the call and he's doing well. He and he said this media attention has really helped him uh, because of this uh, thing that we're doing this video on right now. That's all I got. The eyewitness is you. One of the more serious allegations against you, I felt, was that you stole money from a disabled veteran who contacted you to help fund life saving surgery for his service dog. This is a man called Richard Osthoff. Um, he says that you raised cash on GoFundMe but refused to hand over the money. And AP says the FBI is now investigating this. What is the truth of this? I've never met this man. A lot, 
like I've been abundantly clear. I feel for him. I feel for his story. I am as compassionate and, and as passionate about helping veterans and animals as this is the next guy. I, when I read this, it, it just it hit me like a bag of bricks because I don't know him. And most people who know me, who truly know me, Pierce, knows that if he had met me, his dog would have received the surgery. He wouldn't be homeless. The fact that he was homeless and anybody trying to help him addressed, wouldn't address the homeless issue was a bigger problem for me. And I mean that wholeheartedly. So you've never set up a GoFundMe page? Not, I've, set up, I've set up dozens of GoFundMe no pages. No one will throughout. find one that relates to Let this Let me make this very thing. clear. I've set up numerous GoFundMe pages throughout the years for, for, for animals in needs, many of them who were not managed by me, they were managed by other people, but because I was the main account holder on the Facebook page, it would all go so through So you're not mine. denying there could be a GoFundMe I'm not page. denying there could be a GoFundMe page, but right. I'm denying... And what happened to that money if there is? Like I said, I'm not denying if there's a GoFundMe page and if they're going to present me with one, mm -hmm. I'm not going to deny that, but I've never met him, I've never took on this case, and I never took the money from his dog. All right, Mark, up to this point, what have you seen? What do you think's happening? Yeah, look, there's all kinds of levels of, of, of lying or telling porkies or, you know, telling a whopper, as, as Piers says. And, you know, some of it can be a lot of, of fun. I mean, you know, a lot of creativity is ultimately telling a lie, making up something that wasn't there. And, and I think some of his lies that he's, are quite frivolous because they only really affect him uh some of his lies though are not frivolous at all and they they are more than bordering into the dangerous and move into very very dodgy territory for me so there's a lot of the behavior that i see there i really don't like the look of uh, chase what are you seeing i'm going to wrap this up by giving you a quote from rich the veteran whose dog died because of this person he said, this little girl never left my side in 10 years. And he said, I went through two bouts of seriously considering suicide, but thinking about leaving her without me saved my life. And then he said, I love that dog so much. I inhaled her last breaths when I had her euthanized. That's a big deal. So all we're seeing in this video is an internal behavioral profile of Tarek or Tarek, who we profiled on the Dr. Phil show. It's self-aggrandizing, grandiosity, uh, seeking this inability to admit fault and an agnostic, agnostic addiction to just public attention that is seemingly indifferent as to whether it's positive or negative. Greg? Yeah, this is up to now. What I've seen is this guy could care less about anybody else. And he's simply decorating himself with whatever people need. If you gave him a checklist tomorrow that said he had a horn on his head, he'd try to find a way to make it happen. This guy is fulfilling a checklist that makes everybody who wants him to be what he is happy. So, Scott, you said earlier the whole Forrest Gump thing. It's exactly what he's doing. But Forrest Gump was an accident. Forrest Gump was waving along. I often say I'm kind of the Forrest Gump of, of interrogators. I've been on the right wind and gone the right place and been prepared for it. However, this guy has not done that. He has created the story and he's created details to back him. And he's got a pretty interesting story if he's been, you know, drag queen this and that. But that doesn't qualify you to be a senator or I'm sorry, representative if the people are looking for something else. So if you took a checklist and you created what people wanted on the ballot, that borders on criminal to me, my opinion. And you when you say I should be forgiven, you should be. You can be forgiven. Forgiveness comes all the time. When Alec Murdaugh said last week, I, you know, whatever, if he said I, I should be forgiven, yep, and two consecutive life sentences. That's the way life works. Scott, what do you got? Or, up I got a really all right. I, I up to now I've got a really short sentence. Three three words, one word repeated. Run, Forrest, run. <laughs> all right, fellas, I think this is another good one. And We'll see you next time. So what do you got?